Welcome to the Cannabis Investing Forum Speaker and Investor Pitch Competition, where our featured cannabis industry leaders will educate and inform us about global agriculture, health, medical, science, and technology. Then the Investor Pitch Competition will have companies present their investment opportunities to our investor judges and the audience to be voted on. Be a part of the action, then stick around for a networking room after the webinar. Let's get started. All right, everyone, we're getting ourselves kicked off. Thank you, everyone, for being here today uh, for the Canvas and Investor Forum. My name is Dr. David Kunick, and I'll be your master of ceremonies for today's Canvas Investing Forum webinar. <clears throat> so first off, I want to welcome everyone for being here today. It's great for you to be here depending what part of the country you're in or what country you are even uh, dialing in from, we appreciate you being here today. You're in for some extra great content. So the Canvas Investing Forum is actually a four hour virtual webinar. where we have leading industry speakers presenting companies and investors discussing business opportunities in the cannabis, CBD and hemp industries. Our goals for today are to entertain educate and facilitate connections for investors who want to learn about the industry and more importantly want to invest and for companies and industry professionals who are seeking resources to grow their capital. Today we're actually going to start off with speakers and panels and that we're going to hear a lot then after that we're going to hear a lineup of eight I repeat eight innovative companies that will be presenting uh, their investment opportunity for the investor judges, but also for you, the investor here listening and paying attention today. We're excited uh, for today's webinar that our audience of industry professionals and entrepreneurs is located in over 36 countries. That's right, 36 countries. Uh, you know, we have country, we have people here today represent for all the way from Thailand, from Sweden, Hungary, India, uh, yesterday here in America with St. Patty's Day, we have people on today's uh, Zoom event all the way from Ireland, Argentina, and if I didn't say this, uh, one of our speakers later on today would be upset with me. We also have people here today from the good old country of Colombia. So today's schedule is as follows. We, right now we're doing our opening comments. Then we're going to have several uh, panels uh, between 11.15 a.m. specific standard time till about three o'clock specific standard time. Then uh, approximately three o'clock specific standard time today or 6 p.m. Eastern standard time, I should say, we'll have about an hour and 10 minutes of presenting companies where these presenting companies where go, oh, you know what everyone? I just wanna take a step back and I apologize. Our presenting companies today are actually starting at 1.15 p.m. approximately Pacific Standard Time and 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. Once again, the presenting companies today will be 1.15 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and about 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. My apologies to you all about that. After we do our uh, presenting companies, it's really important to know that there's actually a separate I repeat, there will actually be a separate Zoom networking event. So before we begin, let's just go over a few little things. First and foremost, if everyone looks on the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat button. Make sure when you submit a question in that chat button, you, you click all panelists and all attendees. Once again, on the very bottom on the, on the chat button, when you submit your question or comment, make sure you also click all panelists and all attendees. Right now, as I mentioned, we're doing our, our Zoom webinar, but at the end of today's event, which will happen about 3.20 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, is we'll actually have a Zoom networking event and we'll have a Zoom meeting room. And here's where you have the opportunity where even more connections can occur where more networking can occur, where you can talk with some of the presenting companies directly. You can talk to some of the investor panelists directly. You can talk to even myself, the MC as well too. And this uh, Zoom link for the Zoom meeting was emailed to you prior to today's events. But if you missed it, don't you worry at all. We have you covered here at the Canvas Investing Forum. 
during today's event in the chat room, they will also be posting the registration link for the Zoom meetup after this. And last but not least, if you want access to the webinar agenda, if you want uh, access to the presenting companies, if you want more information about the investor judges, and you also want to look at maybe becoming a speaker yourself for the future or presenting company for yourself for the future, feel free to go to the cannabisinvestingforum.com. Once again, that's a canvasinvestingforum.com. Now, before we begin and I introduce our very first uh, <clears throat> panelist, Dr. John Thompson, I'm gonna give you a quick background about myself. Who is Dr. David and why is he called Dr. David? So very quickly, my name is Dr. David Kunick. I'm actually a doctor of physical therapy and I hold a second doctorate in healthcare management. I've been very blessed to have actually been in the cannabis industry since 2009. I've started seven different cannabis companies in five different states, and I've sat on several state boards for cannabis. Our current company, UCS Advisors and Investor Relations, is we actually help companies get capital. But more importantly, we work with everyday people like, like you and I on this call, and we find them opportunities to invest in. And something that's really unique that we do here at UCS Advisors is if you don't have that extra twenty-five, fifty, or thirty thousand dollars, or hundred thousand dollars laying around, we actually offer a return on investment program of thirty percent within fifteen months for a minimum of five thousand dollars. That's something that we do here that's really unique and different. For the other entrepreneurs on this call, I've been in your shoes before. I've had to raise millions and millions of dollars before for other companies and for my own companies. So I wish everyone the best of luck today. I'm now going to introduce Dr. John Thompson who is the founder and CEO of Extract Lab. And he's going to be presenting today on what is the endocannabinoid system. And from one medical professional to another medical professional, I think this topic is extremely important. And I still joke around because back in 1998, when I looked at my anatomy and pathology book, I saw there highlighted the endocannabinoid system. I can see Dr. John Thompson already in the corner of my screen laughing when I say that as well too. So. So Dr. John Thompson, optimizing global success in cannabis. Dr. John Thompson is a separation scientist, entrepreneur, but also an inventor. As a CEO that is also a scientist, he brings a unique analytical perspective to everything that he does. Whether it's inventing new technology or building a business, he has a strong technical background in analytical instrumentation, biotech, mining, in homeland security markets. During his cannabis career, Dr. Thompson has a strong record of helping companies set up hemp, adult use, and medical cannabis extraction and processing facilities. Dr. Thompson has assisted in, in hundreds of companies to attain their goals in cannabis and hemp extraction and manufacturing, as well as a market development, strategic marketing, and worldwide business-to-business -business alliance formation. But he also does international markets too. And for everyone on this, on this event today, pay attention. It's really important to be able to do his work both domestically and internationally. Dr. Thompson has received a bachelor's of science degree um, in biochemistry, has received a master's of science degree in chemistry and a doctor of, chem uh, doctor of chemistry degree all from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Thompson, thank you for being here today. The floor is yours. I'm going to unmute here. How are you guys doing? Uh, good, good to see you all. Um, there's a small echo here. Let me just kind of kind of make that happen. Okay, I think we're all set. So, all right. Um, welcome to everybody here. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about optimizing your investment, optimizing your business for investment. We're going to be talking a little bit about, um, you know, my experience uh, and where we really um, have invested in the cannabis space, and maybe it'll be uh, somewhat of an inspiration to you guys. Um, there, one thing about this market that's so great is there's so much opportunities for everybody. Um, you're talking about a market that's growing at 20% compound annual growth rate, plus um, there are any number of ways to make money. Um, and I, I've already reviewed some of the um, details from some of the presenting companies. So I'm very interested to hear more from the 
owners and the founders of those companies. Um, just exciting amounts of work. And, and you know, what we do, uh, we actually have put hundreds and hundreds of people into the business of either hemp processing or hunt, hemp um, or, and or cannabis processing and uh, has spent a lot of time uh, dealing with those types of customers, um, getting them up and running from basically starting with nothing, whether it be a farmer or a, um, you know, or a processor, whether they're a GMP provider or not, we've literally put hundreds of people in the business. And as a consequence of that, um, we have spent a lot of time reviewing their business plans. We've learned a lot about how to help them along. Um, sometimes um, talk them out of doing the business altogether um, because they, they just weren't ready or they just didn't have the right business plan associated with it. Um, so I'm just going to, um, first of all, give you a background on, on my business. I'm in the ancillary business. Um, and let me kind of just pull up a, um, a presentation here. Okay, there we are. So the title of the talk is really optimizing your business or optimizing your investment or optimizing your uh, investment portfolio for, for success. Um, I'm going to speak to all three of those topics, in fact. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting, uh, interesting things, when I, when I was in 2014, when I first gave my first pitch to some investors, um, I really started talking about selling picks and shovels to the people who are going to be building the industry. And, um, you know, it, it was uh, at the time, I, it was a 15 minute presentation. It was really quick. Um, and we started our ancillary business, uh, basically focused on equipment, supplies, consulting and consumables for the botanical extracts market. I'm going to go over to you with you what our successes were there. I'm gonna talk about some of the profitable sectors within that ancillary market. Um, also, our views on, on market trends, what we see in the market taking place. Um, and then I'll give you some three keys for optimizing your investment, along with some recommended resources that we'll, we'll plug for you there. So what is it that we do? Um, you know, a lot of companies are out there, they're looking for ways to make their business model work. What we do is we en enable companies to really purify and produce active ingredients. Um, and those can be botanical active ingredients, they can be pharmaceutical act active ingredients. Um, and a lot of times the customers that we deal with, they don't really have, um, some of them have the technical background, some of them do not. Some of them have the business background. Um, and, and sometimes we can put technical and business people together to really make it work for them. So um, we enable in unique combinations of aromas and flavors with our technology. We apply technology and we were able to, for example, enable um, the formulations and proprietary blends that people then bring out into the marketplace. Um, we enable derivatives and purified extracts. And here are just some in uh, examples, uh, you know, aloe vera, mint, uh, batswilia, arnica flower, and many, many others, uh, really botanical extracts that are used in some sort of phyto um, medicinal compounds or phytonutrients or phyto ingredients that are then brought out into the marketplace. And what's wonderful about this is that we do this from an equipment uh, consulting and consumable standpoint, and that's how we really serve the market. So, um, we're really there to apply science. Um, that's been the very foundation of our company. And by the way, it should be the foundation of your company as well. Um, you want to make sure that you are applying the right science in the right place in the right time. So when you're thinking about, um, uh, you know, how you're going to really um, conduct your business, science is the number one thing. And what that will allow you to do is create proprietary solutions, proprietary um, you know, proprietary mixes, proprietary um, designs that then go out into the marketplace. People pay for proprietary things, um, whether that be on a, a unique design or a unique formula. Um, they, they want something that's unique. They don't want something like everybody else is doing. So um, here's just an example of some of the brands that we've put out in the past couple of years. Um, um, and we started originally with our flagship extract lab brand. That's our extractor brand. 
And uh, since that time, we've put out many different equipment brands and also uh, consumables. We have software in there, like I said, um, medical packaging and drug delivery also with, um, you know, from the standpoint of, um, you know, consulting, getting people up and running on, on um, their GMP um, protocols. And these are things that are required by uh, compliancy markets. So, um, you know, we really help people, you know, succeed. Um, we've done a lot in terms of um, making sure that we uh, invest in the science. From those of you who are out there just starting your companies, um, you know, if you're starting from an engineering background, you want to make sure you have that science down, but then make investments in the business side and vice versa. If you're a scientist startup type of person and you um, feel that you're going to go out to market, you really need to have that uh, business background or a business partner there to to really focus on, um, you know, for example, raising money or focus on the financials. Um, you know, you're going to need audited financials if you really want to go public or anything like that. So these are the things that those uh, people are going to help you to do. So um, like I said, we've been very, very successful. Um, we're probably one of the very few ancillary companies that are out there that are actually profitable. Um, for example, we, we drove almost 7 million to the bottom line here in the trailing uh, months. Um, these are some of the awards that we have on the very bottom. We, we have achieved uh, uh, 204 on the Inc. 5000 list uh, with a 2,140% growth. And you can see we've been building up really slowly. Um, it took a lot of work to do that. I know no, uh, you guys who are just starting your companies, um, you're just starting them and, and you know we bootstrapped this whole thing. Um, very, very difficult to do. Um, I always clamoring for cash, for working capital. Um, when you're growing that much, how do you really make that work? Um, so something you need to think about is um, making sure that you have enough working capital so that you can actually deliver the products that you are about to you know, deliver to the rest of the world. It's important also that along the way you make investments in certifications. And whether or not uh, that's a certification for, say, a childproof packaging certification, if you're in the consumer side, a clean label is a really big deal these days. Consumers are demanding, um, you know, higher, cleaner ingredients, higher quality ingredients that are naturally derived, um, you know, obtaining organic certifications. These are the things that um, your customers are going to like, and in turn, they're going to uh, reward you with more sales. Um, which always is going to drive more to the bottom line. Um, here's an example. We actually operate in two different facilities that are about uh, 10 miles away from each other. We have a, a, a large manufacturing facility. It's a, a welding shop, and uh, uh, we have a whole bunch of certifications, ISO 9000 certification. But one of the things that really makes us unique among other, other companies is that we have a 68,000 actually operating GMP certified application center. Um, that's really interesting because we have a full-on laboratory. Our customers can come here and they can see it. Um, and anybody listening to this who wants to learn about how um, you know, processing really takes place, you're welcome to come and visit us um, and uh, look at our materials that we have on the web. We have a tremendous amount of uh, learning materials, including many courses. So I wanted to kind of go over what, what I, how I really look at the ancillary market. Um, back when I was working for corporate America, we would always uh, make these what we called strategy maps. It was kind of a big thing back then in the 90s. Um, and really what you would do is you would, you would lay out a, a process and then you would look where you're playing and then you'd look upstream and downstream. And that would allow you to either formulate an acquisition strategy or formulate a product strategy or something like that so that you can acquire in the, in the proper amounts of in the proper places. And what you see on the, on the map here is, is how we uh, typically look at the uh, botanical extracts market. You can see here where uh, we're really not looking at the growing side at all, um, but we look at uh, you know, how, the, how the products are made once the um, biomass is grown. And when I say biomass, I'm not talking only about cannabis. I'm not talking only about hemp. Um, that's very limiting uh, to, to a marketplace. You, you need to think about the total uh, biosphere, if you will, um, because uh, there's a lot of different uh, compounds, botanicals that have um, an effect actually on the endocannabinoid system. 
and you can use those in their botanical extracts that have nothing to do with hemp, for example, or ha even have nothing to do with cannabis. So um, open your mind on, on your target market. Um, so, but we're in this picks and shovels and you can see that means lab services, lab equipment, excipients, uh, packaging, manufacturing equipment. You can see that as you go through this process, um, you know, you can see that there's potency testing. That's where all the quality equipment is. You can imagine there's lots of consumables associated with that. If you go all the way to the bottom with the end products, that's where you're talking about, um, you know, that's where all the excipients are. are. Um, that's where all the packaging is. Um, that's where all of the, you know, the brands are really sitting there in that end products world. Um, and that's where, you know, both, that can also be a very lucrative area to play. Um, if you're not, if you're actually produced, producing the, the packaging yourself, as opposed to um, just distributing it. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of different ways. We, we operate in uh, pre-processing, extraction, post-processing, and end products. So we've been building, we first started off with the Extract Lab Extractor, which is right there in the middle. And then we went upstream and downstream. So, um, and interestingly enough, we're um, getting heavily into the end product side of this with medical packaging and uh, medical formulations and unique excipients. So uh, this is an example of, you know, the typical process that someone would go through in an ancillary way. They, they'd want to move from the left hand to the right hand side into a higher degree of purity, potency, and identity. And you can see what we did and how we did it was we said, okay, we looked at the value, value chain and we said, okay, well, we're going to start here and then we're going to innovate upstream and downstream of that. I encourage you to, when you're making your... Uh, presentations and your pitches um, to, uh, you know, when you have more time to go through it with an investor, it's always good to make up some sort of strategy map saying, hey, this is what the market really looks like. Here's where we're playing. And here's how, here's a picture of really what it looks like. So, um, you know, like I was saying, when we doing that and following that strategy, um, along with a market strategy, which was focusing on um, you know, botanicals, we really had a really great success. Um, right now, we're right around 25 million in sales. Uh, we have a very nice EBITDA uh, bottom line of about seven. And uh, this year, we'll be doing very, very well as well. This is some examples, some customers that we put together. You can see this. Uh, this is the people actually using, um, you know, either consulting services that we have or buildings that we put together. It's, 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 it's really exciting to see it all come together. So, let me give you some um, probably more unique uh, aspects on what I see as the market trends. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen from our customer base and from people who want to get in, the entrepreneurs, um, the, you know, they're really looking at, you know, uh, the public and private bureaucracy in a lot of cases really circumvented the ability for them to access the market. That's from the SBA side, the DEA side, the FDA side, the national banks, and worse of, worse of all, the, um, the private, um, in other words, the private companies like Amazon, uh, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, Bing, you know, it's very difficult for them to, for example, take a hemp product or a cannabis product they can't really uh, advertise. So they're really spending a lot of time trying to struggling against the entire machinery, the bureaucracy against them. So that, that really is not changed. And, and Ostensibly, they're saying that that's going to change. So when that does happen, we, we ought to see an explosion of, first of all, not only marketing of people who are waiting in the sidelines, but also just an explosion in terms of the packaging and, and all of the ancillary businesses going way up. So um, banking reform is, is number one. I'm very looking, very, uh, looking forward to it. It's going to give um, so ostensibly access to capital markets from a lot of our customers. Um, they're really not able to access them. Um, and it possibly will end that internal bureaucratic war on the legal hemp and marijuana markets, which would be really great. It would enable that. So um, the law, which took uh, and enabled uh, freedom within the market, the bureaucracy basically took away. So we really like to see that kind of regulation relaxed. Um, and then um, MJ reform uh, will not change the laws in other countries. So that's something to note. Those of you who are investors and those of you who are investing, um, you know, there's, there still are other laws. For example, CBD, which is in the U.S., 
um, you know, you can, you can move it across state lines. It's not considered a pharmaceutical drug. In Canada, it's still considered a pharmaceutical drug. In Europe, we have novel food um, regulations that are taking place. Um, and there's, uh, depending on the company that you're dealing with, there's lots of different types of regulations. So you need to be cognizant and aware of that as you make up your business plans. Um, but uh, the fundamentals of the market are still there. They're still looking at pretty good uh, market growth, which is really great. You still have the main drivers as I see them. Um, one of the things that people really use like uh, the endocannabinoid botanical systems for is to reduce or eliminate uh, maybe opioids uh, for, for pain purposes. So um, that's something that is a key driver in the marketplace, I think, and a key adoption driver. Um, increased demand for natural ingredients is more of a general thing. Um, you know, clean label, um, you know, when you get to the point where you can sell to, for example, Whole Foods or a Kroger's grocery or whatever, they're going to be putting clean label requirements on you and things like that. And then still yet, there's lots of fragmentation in the market. Everybody knows this. They see it. A lot of small players. It's, it's regulated. And oftentimes the regulations are insurmountable. It's also fast moving. So one of those things where, um, you know, if you have products that you can really look at uh, over time, it's pretty good uh, to continuously um, put out new products, especially on a consumer side. So just to go over this very quickly, growers, processors, manufacturers, and brands, um, you got to understand where you sit in that eco space, where you sit. Those, these are our customers, but from the standpoint of an, uh, you know, looking at who your customers are, you really got to know your customers. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what the profitable sectors are in the ancillary equipment. Um, the first one is proprietary equipment. Um, if you look at some of the uh, equipment purveyors that are out there that are servicing the extractor uh, and also the uh, ancillary equipment markets, they're, they're pretty profitable. Um, they have good uh, margins. They have great EBITDAs. Um, you know, and so they're, they're not really uh, pulling a lot of negative uh, EBITDA numbers. Um, a lot of them are private. For example, the second one would be the laboratory and uh, GMP services market. Those are the laboratory services market. Those are typically pretty profitable. You know, it's a fee for service type of work. Um, there's lots of labs that have been uh, popping up in this industry. Uh, some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, but it's important to know that those, those laboratories and those services, since they're required and needed, um, with the right marketing plan, they really can be very profitable. Um, and um, you know, we have a laboratory here. We don't do other people's samples with it, but um, you know, it's very important that you have as a part of your workflow. For example, if you're if you're running a, a manufacturing facility, that you have those uh, quality control, quality assurance uh, aspects to your business. So, uh, and then unique and proprietary packaging focused on compliance and fashion. Okay, so this is something where um, you know distributor models for packaging and things like that. They they're typically very low, very low margin. Um, but if you can, for example, make your own packaging with your own molds um, and uh, make those very um, fashionable so that they become um, something where, you know, you're, you're talking about better margins, like a 40, 50, even 50% gross margin, then you really have a good business. So um, those are, there's lots of opportunities for that. And, um, and I think that you'll be seeing a lot more unique packaging people who are going to invest in tooling and things like that to really um, produce some, you know, even medical grade packaging. So that's, that's all in store. So I'm just gonna give you a couple keys for investment in your company. Um, this is for investors and for those who are, uh, you know, trying to get people to invest in the company. Just some three keys from everybody that I talked to. Um, maximize the liquidity of your investment. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk just slightly about debt and then for criteria that we use to assess a client's business plan. It's really important that when you raise money, you have um, liquidity in mind. Your investor is going to want to um, have his, um, he's going to want to understand where his exit money is going to come from. Where is he going to make money in the situation? A um, couple ways to do that. You can just, you know, for example, sell him the majority control, and then he can decide whatever he wants to do with it. He can take it public. Um, he can, um, you know, decide what he wants to do with the um, EBITDA that's generated from, from sales. 
Um, so that is one way to do it. And you're there, you'll, you'll obviously be a minority um, shareholder, but that is actually a, a very good way to do it. Um, cash is still king in every business, ha always has been that way through all of millennia. And so oftentimes, if you can get someone to take your business over and you can work for them, that, that's probably a really good option. Um, and um, then also um, preferential payout on earnings. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Um, most investors, from what I know, don't, don't buy that uh, because there's always a need for EBIT um, and there's always a need for more working capital. So it turns out that you know, EBIT is not really distributed or um, you know, the distributions are very far, few and far between. So um, the investor is not too keen on that typically. Um, the other way to do it is to, to engage in a registered or unregistered public offering that results in freely traded shares. Um, something that we are looking at um, for our company very closely is the Regulation A. Um, this is for companies that are, um, that are you know, maybe in the 20 to, you know, maybe 10 to $20 million. They're looking to really grow out. Um, you, know, you can have a public offering of 20 to 75 million. Uh, depending on the tier, it's fully tradable shares upon closing. They're exempt from regulation uh, or registration, excuse me. Um, so lots of really great benefits. I think that, um, you know, you can talk to your investment advisor and really understand, hey, um, you know, what are the different options for, um, it's for, for a public offering? It's not just an IPO. Um, there's ways you can do it. Um, by combining an RTO um, and, and this regulation A and really doing a, a great job at going and, and looking at the market. So one of the interesting things about this particular um, regulation is that you're able to test the waters with uh, offerings ahead of time with those who will listen. So um, you can kind of pre-test the waters without having to um, you know, be really um, restricted in what you say. Um, a lot of times in a typical IPO, um, you would have a very restricted amount of time. So also it allows you to crowdfund. So um, there's other pipe, Reg D, Reg S, SPAC, IPO. Uh, just suffice it to say that, that is a, there's a lot of really good options for you guys. You should talk to an investment advisor. Um, if, you, Thompson, if you have, you um, especially if left. you have um, sales with EBIT, um, which means profit, a profitable sales. Um, if you have target acquisitions, if you have an aggressive growth plan, if you have ongoing need for capital, these are all reasons why you would want to consider going public. So now I'm just going to talk quickly about debt. Um, every every person that you talk to is going to... You got, you got about 45 seconds left, Dr. Thompson. 45 seconds? Yep. Okay, so every person that you're going to talk to um, about uh, debt, you've got to really... Um, Really an important thing there uh, to, to, to look at. So um, banking is not really a viable option for marijuana companies. Um, banks often confuse MJ with hemp. So keep that in mind. Um, a lot of times people have a hard time getting debt for their companies. And PPP loans are a unique investment risk now, unfortunately. So anybody who's received a PPP loan, um, that's a real issue. So think about that when you're talking about it. So um, to close up here, um, there are a couple qualifications that we use, typical qualification questions that we use to determine if your business plan is viable. Do you have assets? Do you have a license? And most importantly, where are your customers? You should identify those up ahead of time. And do you have money for working capital? So um, also today is, is in a kind of very uh, distressed environment in terms of companies that are out on the marketplace. So people are looking around for deals. Um, they're gonna lowball your company probably on valuation. Um, and if you did well in 2020, they're going to discount that. If you did do so well, they, won't, they, they wanna count that. So um, my advice is don't waste a lot of time with national banks either um, because you're gonna have a lot of problems. Um, they're not gonna fund you probably. So I, I, there's a lot of brokers and people out there that are um, saying that they can do it, but it's very, very difficult to do. Um, so that having All been right. said, here's some resources okay. for you guys. If you want to learn more about, um, you know, the marketplace, we have a tremendous amount of mini courses and guides and calculators and podcasts. I hope you guys found it uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Very, very informative. Uh, one thing I, I always recommend Dr. Thompson after the, after you're done talking 
You can just put uh, your key contact information or your LinkedIn, uh, whatever the best way to contact you in the chat room. That'd be great for everyone here listening. And Dr. Thompson, I have some really great points with investors and some really great points also with exit strategies. Um, definitely a, a ball of knowledge. So thank you again. I really do uh, appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is going to be talking about what is the outlook for raising capital in 2021. And the person that's going to be leading that discussion is going to be Matt Norgren. And Matt has a very great and, and unique background. I'm very proud to say I've been an investor judge with uh, Matt Nor Norgren several times. I've actually met with uh, other people that he, he's actually mentored as well too in the industry. <clears throat> so John really is, I'm sorry, Matt is really a, a someone that you really want to pay attention to. So with that being said, uh, Matt Norgren is actually the, currently the CEO and co-founder of Arcadian Fund and Arcadian Capital Management, which is a venture capital slash private e equity strategy focused on ancillary services providing companies in and around cannabis and the hemp industry. Some unique facts about uh, Matt is he actually received his education from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, he also played football at uh, the University of Texas for the Texas Longhorns, and he was a quarterback on the national championship winning team. Um, and what's really cool and unique about Matt is that he was able to actually take a lot of those skills that he learned and developed uh, out while at the University of Texas, and he was able to implement that throughout his lifetime and also into his core business philosophies. While playing football on a scholarship at the University of Texas, Matt, he's also a very smart man too. He not only graduated with one, but with two degrees within four years and was also accepted into and pursued a master's degree at the University of Texas. Matt had the pleasure and the honor to actually play professionally for the Detroit Lions, as well as the Philadelphia Eagles, which is part of the National Football League. Mr. Uh, Norgren went on to earn a dual master's degree in both business administration and sports management from the University of Dallas. From his time doing that, Matt uh, was featured on the Bravo TV show, Most Eligible, da Most Eligible Dallas. If you remember that TV show, Matt was on that. And while, while Nobody that happened, saw he actually, that, David. Well, oh, you don't know, you know about that part. You know what? You, you, you were sold in there, that. but Matt, let me just give you the, <laughs> let, me, let, let me give you this last paragraph because I don't want to underestimate you. The most important thing is this, is that Matt has been appointed to many executive leadership positions with a wide ranging group of companies and industries from real estate to sports entertainment, from hospitality to insurance and financial services. Matt truly is a pioneer and is a, is a unique leader in emerging industries to later stage leverage buyouts. He's really focused on finding synergistic opportunities in early stage private growth rounds that have upside potential. Everyone as someone who I've learned always something from Matt each time I hear him speak. Thank you for being here today. The floor is yours, sir. Well, hey, thanks, David. I, you know, hang around too, man. We can um, talk through things you think are important. There's, it seems like a lot of folks are on here. So, you know, really glad to uh, have the opportunity to share some of our thoughts. Uh, that introduction makes you feel old, but those of us in the cannabis industry, I think, you know, but you hear people talk about it like dog years. It, it feels like seven years per year. And just because of all the things that happen and how, how quickly things change. And for those of you and those of us that can solve that problem and continue to pivot and grow with it, uh, you're able to build a real nice barrier to entry because those institutionals that are starting to look at this today, and let me just tell you, the conversation has changed. It's changed definitely. It definitely changed after uh, January 6th. Uh, and then in the South, they needed to see a little more. And after, um, you know, Biden took office, it was, it was, it was apparent to the institutionals, the conversation changed. We had been, you know, um, fighting that battle for many, many, many years. The reason we built Arcadian the way we did, um, you know, was to essentially be able to be, call it an Andreessen Horowitz of the botanical wellness space. But, but ultimately, you know, that to, to, to break down glass ceilings and, and open up uh, the industry's resources to uh, these large institutionals, you have to check a certain amount of boxes. 
And, um, you know, we really wanted to keep our eyes focused on the ancillary market because we know that if you can prove performance and build multiple funds and have exits, that there is, um, if timed right, uh, the ability maybe to access institutional capital that is very, very, very large. And frankly, we feel like we have a responsibility to the industry to do that. Um, and we're only as good as the companies that we invest in are. And so, uh, you know, fortunately, these companies are really good right now. 62% growth last year. Are you kidding me? This is, these are, this is, you know, people keep asking all these questions. What's going to be driving the market? Safe Banking Act now and this and that. And how about quarterly earnings? Okay. And those aren't going to stop. And now Mexico's in. Uh, fully and a lot to tell you about there um, can't go into great detail uh, but some really exciting things are happening in that market and so you know potentially with uh, I don't know you could argue we're still in a bull market I mean even through coronavirus to be frank uh, is there a bear to come I don't know it's the longest cycle ever probably can interest rates be like this always? I don't know. Are tech companies a little bit overvalued? I mean, if you take the top five to seven companies out of the equation last year, the FANG stocks, most people's, you know, major, the major allocators returns are more like 7%. Just with five or seven companies taken out. And then if you go a little deeper and take the top 30 companies out from a return standpoint last year, most allocators on average are going to be in the negative. And so it, there, there really is a bear there. And these top seven companies can't quite possibly do what it, it looks like. And so I think when you see markets start to change on top of the fact that cannabis is this commodity-like uh, industry that has tech and biotech type returns. I mean, how often does that happen? Um, so uh, the, the cash that these large you know, multi-state operators are generating, um, the companies that service them, uh, the strength of this category and, and servicing this category, the complexity of it, you know, the, the barrier to entry that we talked about earlier. It's, it's just getting really exciting. So Matt, let me ask you a question just because it's really hot for the last few days and you may not have an answer, but I think a lot of people want to hear your response so. Um, for the outlook for raising capital, what do you think the effect of the PACT Act is going to have on the industry? Um, and for those that aren't familiar, the PACT Act is the one saying that you, uh, the United States Postal Service can't uh, send anything in the mail with the vaporizer products, e-cigs, and, and it has some people concerned about that. And there's still a lot of gray area, and I know it's very raw, Matt, but you know, as someone who invests, as someone myself who invests, you know, how do you think that's going to really change the outlook for the next maybe three to six months with, uh, with, the, with the, that? Yeah, see, the trend is so big, though. Think about um, the cannabis industry is probably the greatest uh, opportunity in the history of consumer ingredients. It, it, potentially, it's the most dynamic, the most complex, um, and at the molecular level, the most interesting, you know, for, 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 for what human beings need at the cellular level. So, you know, I could argue that if you think about the direction this industry is moving and you look at GW Pharma with just a few FDA approved drugs uh, sell themselves for what, 7.7 .7 billion to Jazz Pharmaceuticals the other day. Uh, if, you, if you've got biotech IP and you're in phase two clinical work and getting into phase three and you're about to come and replace opioids, there is a part of this industry as an ingredient set uh, that is so big happening that does it matter if the Postal Service can't send vape pens? I mean, th there's so many tailwinds in so many categories. Can we, um, you know, be better uh, served to understand some of the things and the more the road bumps that'll happen? Yeah. And for the last 10 years, we've all been doing this. They continue to come, but we just keep going right over them. And, and it's because it's so strong in so many areas. Uh, the byproducts from hemp, you know, a half a Home Depot in 10 years will probably be hemp fiber somewhere. Um, you know, so do, do they care about it? All these things are important, but what we have to understand is the big picture. And the big picture is so strong. Um, as long as, particularly with the change in the markets, may happen ahead, 
this industry is going to become increasingly more interesting um, for, for allocators that are trying to balance uh, a portfolio in that environment, looking into their alternatives, generating some extra yield. So um, yeah, uh, we can, you know, let's stay focused uh, on the big picture, but obviously the little things are going to be uh, issues we're going to have to deal with. And, and I appreciate you saying that, Matt. Um, we've been telling our own clients and our own investors to calm down and remember the bigger picture. And, you know, the, the ball's rolling and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And even if, as you just said, too, it's about the bigger picture and looking past the hood of the car. So I really appreciate you saying that. So thank you. Still there, Matt? <laughs> yeah, I was here. I was seeing if you were going to throw a question, throw a direction. Oh, I, I come on. No, <laughs> no, I was just saying that I, th I think it was just really good that that you brought that part about the pack about, about yeah. the bigger picture. So, what's important for this for the for the crowd? I see friends here, John, and so I, I think for the crowd is this, and I think what most people looking at the questions is, is the following: you as an investor, and you think about the bigger picture. What are the top two or three items or or objective points? A, a, a company should think about before approaching an investor? Well, first and foremost, try to understand who it is you're talking to. Nothing drives an investor more crazy than if you figure out how to get into a conversation about, you know, um, educating an investor on the story and then only to realize that you don't even come close to meeting the mandates of what they're trying to do. Instead, you know, it's hard enough to get that call. So make sure when you get on the phone and you're having conversations with people that may could provide you resources that you do is, is, as good a job as you can to understand who they are, uh, what position they may be in. Um, you know, uh, so that will give you an advantage because then you can speak to the, the most likely scenario for you guys to align. If this is a late stage growth equity investor, for example, I mean, you're looking, them up and you can get information to see they're doing these big, you know, late stage equity deals, then you go into the conversation and say, Hey, I'm glad to be on the phone with you. From what I can tell, we might be a little bit early, but maybe not. I mean, maybe you, but you know, we love the type of stuff you're doing. We see this deal that you did. What were you thinking there? You know, and, and then here's how we fit in and could. And so I think that's, that's something that I really want to want to make an emphasis on is just doing the extra work. We do that as, you know, fund managers. We have to have an investments team that takes these things in and and gets the information uh, in front of us, so we can be clearly, uh, you know, following protocols, but understanding like how we can bring value. What's this conversation about? Because we just don't get on the phone, you know. Preparation. Uh, so you ask for three things: preparation, execution, integrity. Um, you know, you got to prepare for anything in life. It doesn't matter what it is. Like if you want to achieve something, you don't just start, you have to prepare. And so preparation is one and then execution. I mean, um, you, you know, you've just, you've got to see things through all the way to the end. And then I think the one that a lot of people don't talk about, but something we look for and there's ways of doing it, uh, but integrity, uh, because it's just not worth doing business with people that, uh, <laughs> you know, are going to make things not fun because this is so much fun. We'd rather not do business and make money with someone. There's too many places to make that happen now. And so uh, integrity. And, and I'm, I'm really happy you said integrity because everyone here listening, especially if you're new to the industry, is that this industry is small. And someone like Matt, who's been in for a while, you mentioned like the dog years. And, you know, it seems like we've been in for a very long time is that if you don't have that uh, good business ethics, you don't have that right integrity, people are not going to want to work with you and that will spread around. And a great example is there's a deal that was brought to us that was turned on by two other people. And we already knew about it ahead of time because of, of a pain and, and said, uh, how much of a pain in the butt they were and how they really didn't have good business eth ethics. And I'm going to I'll take another step on what Matt said. It. And Matt, I'd love to hear your feedback on this. And we have about eight minutes left. You talked about preparation. You talked about how, Hey, you're not going to get on the phone right away. So in your opinion, um, would you recommend people having like a one page executive summary or like a one page teaser to send that out to people to look at first to, to even draw interest first or? Yeah, what, I think what, so. I think so. Because, you know, like anything in life, um, 
the more you only say what needs to be said means that you are re listening more and you're receiving more um, data. And so, uh, you know, in an emerging industry, a manager uh, is, if he's doing it right, and I can just tell you how we think, and by the way, there are 10 or 15 or 20 really great funds in this space, and this is how we all think. And and that's to say that you want to be in have an insatiable appetite for for information. And so we want to see everything in the industry because it allows us to help put the industry together. I mean, we're, we're all interested in this whole thing working and, and particularly being ahead of uh, regulators such that we have this thing tied up and we have strength in the way that it needs to, um, you know, benefit the people that got it here. So uh, I, give us a one pager because, you know, we, we, we as managers are not we're not trying to say no, you know, in a lot of industries, if you get to someplace that's an investor, the first step is going to be with somebody whose job is to say no. If you even get a response, they're just <laughs> so well said, <laughs> right? But I think in our industry, it's a little bit different. I, I, my team, I can promise you, we want to chew on every single piece of data that we can. It doesn't matter what it is. And so not to leverage companies against each other. I mean, look, for example, we're investors in BDS analytics and headset. The fact that you can invest in the two leading data companies in the space speaks to your character. They understand that we use information properly and only for the benefit of everybody. And so if you give us just the information that we need, okay, we want to understand the business. And we're thinking about it, you know, how, how does this whole thing work together? How does our ecosystem of companies uh, uh, benefit your business? We, we, it's for us to understand you more concisely. And so I think just don't be afraid to be whoever you are. There's only upside. So just be, uh, be the business you are, present, you know, the information in a very concise way, uh, because we actually in this space really want to see it all. But it's sometimes discouraging when things come in and, you know, people are trying to be overly salesy and you can't really see what's what, and they're just trying to get on a call. And you're like, friend, I do want to get on a call. Trust me, we do. But, you know, can we be a little smarter about the business before we get on a call? It's just better for everybody. It's so busy. Let's be efficient. So yes, just get us, you know, break it down and take it's steps. So, it's it. so well said. And not to date myself, we tell our clients it's like the old song by CNC Music Factory. Things that make you go, hmm. Your one page teaser should say to someone like us, hmm, this looks interesting. Okay, I want to learn more. I want to know more. And I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. And Matt, we have two minutes left. So the floor is yours for the next two minutes. What would you like to, what message would you like to give the audience here today? Wow, that's a, um, a tough, I guess, strength in, in numbers, you know, uh, because we're heading into this inflection point where, um, you know, by midterms 2022, it, it ought to be very interesting, right? Because you need 60 votes in Senate right now. Um, you definitely want to have the uh, visibility to get something on Biden's desk, you know, before um going in the midterms understanding okay you know what states are important by the way because those state senators depending on what they run on uh then if that state uh you know is is a positive state whether republican or democrat you, it comes with two votes okay in the senate so every state is equally important as the next because of those senate votes and and we think there's a lot bigger issues OK, that, that are going on over the next year and a half. And this is a bipartisan issue in comparison to others. And so I think you're going to see both sides come to some agreements going into midterms. It's a popular topic for, uh, you know, raising capital and and, and g getting votes in every state pretty much. And so you'll see more people run on that that didn't have to in the le last election cycle. So we think after midterms, um, there's a really good chance that some that some big big things happen there. In advance of that, you know, banking will probably happen. Some other things, uh, inclu including quarterly earnings. And so I'll, I'll, I think the, the the reason I tell you that is because it's time for us to be thinking work together. Yep. You know, it's like if you watched uh, Game of Thrones or something. It's like the the Night Walkers are coming. Okay, it, <laughs> it's inevitable. And if you don't all come together as kingdoms, 
you, you know, you'll, you'll, you, it'll be much more difficult, but together it's a, it's a great victory. And, uh, and I hope that Arcadian can be a part of that. Visit our website. Hope you, hope you, we can talk to you soon, but um, God bless you. You know what, Matt, your timing was perfect. You ended right on time. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if you have any other questions, please reach out to, to Matt uh, directly. Please, uh, he'll put his contact information uh, in there. Also, to really pay attention to what he said. You know, you need to prepare ahead of time, okay? Work on that one-page executive summary, because I'll tell you right now, if you have that one-page executive summary, you're going to open up a lot more doors than sending out your 30 or 40-page pitch deck, because myself, I'm sure Matt and other uh, investors here and other from other funds will get sent all these decks and we're like, it's 30 pages. Just give me the one page summary. Let's make this more simplistic. So, um, so Matt, once again, thank you so much. Also for all the panelists, please make sure you look at the Q and A in case there's any questions for you. Um, once again, uh, Matt, Matt Norgren of Arcadian Capital and we are going to move on to our next, uh, our next panelist. Thanks again, Matt, really do appreciate it. So our next panel topic is what role does security compliance play in having Wall Street invest in cannabis? And I'm very proud to say that uh, my fr a friend of mine, John Nemanik, uh, who is a partner in Green Coast Capital will actually be moderating this. And uh, before I, I do John's intro, John, hola, como esta? I Muy bien, gracias a usted. <laughs> uh, bien, gracias, mi amigo, gracias. So, so John does a lot uh, of work down in South America, specifically Colombia. John's a partner in Green Coast Capital Investments. Green Coast is an international investor providing flexible and innovative financing to the small cap and micro cap marketplace in a, a variety of sectors. His team consists of experts in capital markets making quick decisions to provide growth capital to issuers. John is a serial entrepreneur and an investor. He was a co-founder, chairman, and CEO of three, I repeat, three very successful internet startups. The first one was in 2006. We raised over 29 million and then sold it to Deluxe Communications for over 124 million. He also had a couple other groups, uh, which uh, he sat here and was able to sit here and increase their market cap to over $600 million. And in 1999, uh, his internet direct company was merged with Look Communications for a dean value of $560 million. So everyone paying attention, John's the real deal. He knows what he's doing. His current interests are medical cannabis, cultivation hemp, CBD startups with a focus, and I repeat, a focus in Colombia. He's married to uh, Dr. Sandra Carrillo, a leading expert in cannabis for clinical applications, and was appointed the clinical professor in charge of the scientific program for cannabis research and education for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Panama. John manages Panamanian and Colombian-based companies. He's a former member of EO Panama and has extensive contacts within Panama. He was also a former member of EO in Toronto. And right now, he's really looking for high return opportunities to invest in and serve as a director for high quality cannabis related firms. Everyone, John is an entrepreneur, an investor, both domestically and internationally. And he understands the medical component to this side of the medicine as well too. John, thank you for moderating today's panel. The rest of the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dave, for a most wonderful introduction. I think I should leave now on this high note. I mean, it's not gonna get any better. <laughs> Anyways, I never cease to be impressed by the quality of the speakers. John Thompson, Matthew Norgren, thank you for your insights. It's extremely valuable. And Matt, in particular, your commentary reminds me of many years past when I worked as a manager at the Bank of Nova Scotia Mid-Market Accounts. When it came to granting loans, we had two questions. What do they want? And how can we say no? Needless to say, I got sick of being in banking after a couple of years, but it was a great experience. Anyways, I'd like to start by introducing Ted Bernhardt, Managing Director, Cotiva Law, and Kevin Albert, Independent Director, NorCal Cannabis Company. Ted, please give us a one to two minute introduction. Ted, take it away. Yep, uh, thanks for the intro. It's an honor to be on the panel here today. Um, I, my, my name is Ted Bernhard. I'm the 
uh, managing partner for Cultiva Law. We are a cannabis dedicated business and finance law firm that is based on the entire West Coast of uh, the United States here. We have offices in Seattle, Portland, where I'm based, uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles and are gradually uh, expanding eastward. Um, and so our, our firm is focused on uh, helping entrepreneurs raise capital and uh, get into the industry and structure their transactions uh, uh, in a, a legally compliant manner. Uh, my background is uh, I've, I've been doing this since the mid to but since about 2015, uh, before that, I was in the, uh, I, the uh, technology spaces and energy spaces, and I actually acted as a, a, a general partner of, of four different venture capital funds before I started practicing law. So anyway, it's an honor to be here, and thanks for the uh, introduction. You know, I, was, I Googled your bio, and you were Portland's Business Journal 40 Under 40 Award, given the most accomplished, influential, and uh, Civic minus, uh, minded executives in Portland. Just want to say, good for you. And you know what? You have the type of bio we could spend 20 minutes just discussing your accomplishments. That's really nice of you to say. Yeah, it's well, an honor. It's just the truth. So on to uh, Kevin Albert. Kevin, please give us a one to two minute introduction. Sure. Thank you, John. And I've, I'd like to find out how you guys got those screensavers behind you. Uh, all I have is <laughs> a, a picture of people laying on a beach somewhere. Um, so my name is Kevin Albert. Um, and I guess uh, I have a, a, a very institutional background. So it's probably quite appropriate for this panel. I spent uh, the first 24 years of my career uh, as a banker at Merrill Lynch. Um, for, and for most of that time, I raised, I, I ran the private placement group. Uh, which both raised funds for private equity firms, general purpose private equity firms, and it raised money for emerging growth companies like the companies in this industry, um, albeit bigger size deals than uh, many of the placements that get done in this industry. Um, I uh, then subsequently after leaving Merrill Lynch, I worked for two private equity firms um, uh, and I retired in December 2019, just in time to be locked down and stuck at home uh, in the, uh, during COVID. I started investing in this industry in 2016 on a personal basis, both because of the dynamics of the industry um, and because, you know, I know my limitations and I'm not going to be ever going to be a successful venture investor in healthcare or AI or any of these highly technical things. But this is basically a consumer industry. I'm a consumer. I know what I like. I can make assessments as to what other people like. And, you know, it was sort of my view that uh, by investing in this industry, you knew the product worked, you knew people would buy it. And the only question was the management teams and their ability to execute. And I think that sort of enters into this topic because uh, it's, it's really all about the management teams, both in terms of execution on the business plan but also in terms of setting up compliant companies that have good corporate governance. And as in any emerging industry, that typically isn't the case in the very beginning. In the very beginning of any industry, but particularly this one, which was federally illegal, um, you, you find that many of the companies were founded uh, in, the, in the early days by dreamers, by entrepreneurs, by people who had been black market cultivators or black market distributors. Um, and they are probably the best people to have spawned these industries, but they're probably not the best people uh, to get the attention of Wall Street ultimately. Um, and because they don't have the background, it's not that they're not smart and capable, they just don't have the background um, of having you know, come up the ranks. So that's my background. I'm on the, I'm the board of three California companies currently, uh, one public one, Harborside, uh, and, two, and two private ones, Locana and, uh, and NorCal, and I'm on the advisory board of, of one of the industry funds. You know, again, I, I also Googled your background, Kevin, and I noticed, for example, that you're associated with Harbor, uh, Harborside. I actually participated in the most recent private placement with Harborside. Well done, good work, you know? So just, I just wanted to declare that if anybody sees that as a possible conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> no, Anyways. no, no, we're, all, uh, we're, we're aligned. 
we're allowed. Well, of course, of course. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, to be frank, for open disclosure, I'm probably, in, I haven't counted recently, but probably at eight different private placements just in my own personal accounts, plus what I'm doing also with Green Coast as well. So anyways, gentlemen, uh, I'd like to open up with the following questions and we'll ask both of you. So I'm going to ask the question and both of you, I'd like you to provide your perspective on this. And, uh, you know, Kevin, you've already alluded, you've already sort of um, segued nicely into, um, uh, into investing into the risks. And what I'd like to do is open by this with the following. So during my um, early four days, forays into cannabis investing, I thought <laughs> I understood regulatory risk and I was wrong. I underestimated, for example, just how challenging it can be to stay on side. How do you manage regulatory risks as a director with the companies you're associated with? And tell us why it is so important because I, don't, because I believe there are some people who are not familiar with what the challenges of regulatory risk are and how that can really, really put holes into their aspirations. Which one? I don't okay, want to uh, let, let me rephrase. What do you what What do you see as the uh, how do you manage regulatory risk? What do you do with your entities? Like you're saying on the board of Harborside. Yeah. Side. So okay. Yeah. So in, in my opinion, well, first of all, as a director, you can't actually make it happen in the con mm -hmm. in the company because right. you're a director. You're not. You're actually supposed to be supervising management as opposed to doing things yourself. Because if you do them yourself, there's nobody overseeing you. Um, and that's one principle of, of good corporate governance. Um, so what, what is important for the directors to know is it's important for them to know the regulatory regime, what the key rules are, what the regulators are focused on, um, and then to employ good compliance people or a person, depending on the size of the company, and to ensure that that person you know, has a game plan uh, for addressing those issues and and does it, and to evaluate that on a you know a semi-annual, a quarterly basis. Sort of depends again on the size of the company. The best example of the downside of not doing that is a company called Lowell in California, which is a, a branded uh, uh, a flower pre-roll company, uh, which uh, got caught. I think about 18 months ago, uh, operating out of an unlicensed facility. They were licensed. They had all the tip, you know, license they needed to do to, to prosecute their business um, you know, in general. But for some reason or other, they decided to cut a corner and, and, and operate out of an unlicensed facility for a period of time. Um, and it went from being probably the hottest brand at that particular point in time uh, to a company that became quickly distressed um, and, and just recently had to sell itself uh, at a fraction of what its value was uh, back at that particular period of time. Because who, who's going to invest? You know, all of these companies need a continuing flow of, of capital to come in to grow. And who's going to put money into a company that has a breach like that mm -hmm. when really most of the other companies don't. Most of the other companies are compliant. I mean, the regulatory aspects of this industry are, are very significant and, and the regulators are very serious about it because if the states don't do a good job, then the feds may come in. Uh, that basically the whole, I forget what it, the letter is called, but the letter that Obama had issued, which, which said, uh, hands off the states, it said hands off the states if they are doing a good job in, in, in terms of, of, of managing this industry. Well said. And for all you uh, would-be entrepreneurs out there who are serious about going in this sector, remember what he just said. Lowell's was extremely successful and um, they literally watched their dreams, if you'll pardon the pun, go up in smoke. So um, now I'm gonna go on to Ted Bernhardt, who is a securities attorney. And Ted, I'd like to ask you a similar question. Um, what advice do you give your clients on how to manage the regulatory risk? It's a great question. And, and um, I, I appreciate both of your insights on that. Uh, first of all, I think you're referring to the Cole memo, um, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. So yeah. The, um, uh, it's interesting because um, my 
law practice in our firm, we, we work with people uh, across the entire spectrum from the very earliest stage to, you know, IPO and, uh, and the latest stage. Um, but I would say most of the um, people that uh, first come to us are, are coming to us in the very early stages. And a lot of them are, are coming from um, the, basically the pre-legalization era, the medical industry, the, you know, I'm not going to say the black or the gray market or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I raise with people is before I even get into the details of how regulated this is, what the specific regulations are that they have to comply with, I, I want them to understand that uh, they need to commit to being regulatorily compliant, that this industry uh, has sort of a wild west cowboy, you know, uh, 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 a reputation history or whatever uh that's changing and um you have to change your business models and your compliance mentality in order to do that so it, you know the first thing i try and convince people of is that uh the uh, you know if you want to achieve the path to liquidity and the legitimacy of this market you have to be aware that it's highly regulated and that you have to be committed to uh complying with those sorts of regulations. Then I sort of turn to you, uh, talking to them about what the, 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 the types of regulations are that they have to deal with. And, you know, it's, you've got federal and, and state regulations. You've got, you know, uh, uh, people a lot of times don't realize that uh, uh, like things like securities laws uh, apply to them here. And if you're raising <laughs> money yeah. at the startup <laughs> stage, uh, you know, just because it's from friends and family, you still have to be worried about all that sort of thing. So I kind of try and in the, in the introductory sessions, I kind of try and flag issues and areas of compliance for them based on my experience uh, with things that trip people up and uh, get them started to think about it. And then, you know, you know, obviously I encourage them to keep a good dialogue going with me and their other professional service providers and to recruit people who are familiar with uh, these sorts of uh, compliance risks and really build out their team to come up with a, 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 a regulatory <laughs> compliance infrastructure that 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 will help them and then you know then th then we sort of dive into the specific details and the last thing i will say is that i i also very much try to give them a reality check that there are there are actual economic consequences to these regulations it's not just about whether you go to jail or not there's a hmm. lot of time and energy that you have to spend in complying with these various regulations that, and, and to just be ready for that and build those into your financial models and your projections and your operating plans and and all that sort of stuff. So um, it, it goes back to what you both were saying, sort of educating people about these risks as early on before it becomes a problem so that you're not trying to fix it in the future, but you're making them aware so that proactively they can um, deal with them. So that, that's kind of the approach I take generally. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. You just shared some extremely valuable information for those who are paying attention. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna bounce back to Kevin Albert and Kevin, I'd like to ask, what in your view are the greatest opportunities in the cannabis space? And what do you see as the greatest challenges? So I, I think we're, we've largely moved uh, uh, through this sort of early entrepreneurial start a new company from scratch, at least in the vanilla categories of like uh, cultivation and manufacturing and and and, uh, and and retail, if you will, dispensaries. Um, there's always going to be more opportunities, and certainly there are going to be new entrepreneurial opportunities in new states that are opening up. But in states like California um, or or Washington or Co or Colorado, I, I think there are probably enough platforms in that area. And so I think the uh, there are two kinds of opportunities. One are the more scientific opportunities, you know, tissue culture, biotechnology, medicine, um, all of which start to exceed. I know I'm not going to be good at, so that kind of, that's the kind of exposure I look to get in a fund. I can mm -hmm. figure out if I if a dispensary platform is a good one or a, a cultivation platform is a good one. I'm out in California right now. I visited ten dispensaries and about six farms in the last two days. Um, and, uh, but I think the big general opportunity right now is to help rationalize and consolidate the industry. One of the unique parts of this industry, yeah. one of the reasons I got into it is it is funded by individuals and family offices 
And even the funds that exist, the 10 to 15 funds, are funded by individuals and family offices. So there's no institutional money uh, and there's no private equity. Typically, private equity firms, and there are hundreds of them, as you know, they are the people who come in and rationalize an industry. They take the inefficient companies and bolt them on to the efficient companies and make them bigger, you know, train them how to become public companies. Um, and, you know, not RTO, tiny micro cap public companies, but real mm -hmm. public companies. And <laughs> that opportunity now exists for us. And one of the things I'm out here doing in California on, on, on behalf of one of the companies I'm involved in is helping to, tr is, is trying to do that uh, with them, trying to make them bigger by finding, um, uh, op you know, merger opportunities, basically. Uh, because that's now what happen, has to happen in this industry. We don't need, we don't need hundreds of small companies. We need, um, you know, handfuls of big, dynamic, vertically integrated companies, at least in states where vertical inter integration um, is allowed. So I'd, I'd encourage people to look for opportunities to invest with very capable management teams who have their own house in order, who are ready to help start clean up this industry. Excellent. You know, I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs appreciate just how important what you what you just said about the roll-ups and the M and A's. Let's say, for example, a company like Atria Mo, they're not going to waste their time buying anything that's under a billion dollars because it's just not going to move the needle for them. So, if you All could right. do a roll-up and consolidation, then you actually have real exit strategies. And yes, being a Canadian and knowing a little bit about RTOs, <laughs> I get where you're coming from. So, yeah. Anyways. I'm going to bounce now to Ted yep. and Ted being a securities lawyer, being a lawyer, I think or an attorney, you can appreciate this. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to help us answer this question. I'd like to know, how do you protect IP in a federally illegal industry? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Yeah. And um, IP is, is certainly a, a huge portion <laughs> and probably an increasing portion of the uh, valuable assets of the companies in this industry. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of ways to protect IP and, uh, you know, I could spend an entire day talking mm -hmm. about that, but I will give you sort of the thumbnail sketch that maybe has some, some tips that, that could help. Um, so all IP is people, when people say IP initially, they think of usually like patents filed with the federal government or trademarks filed with the federal government. Uh, there is an entire world of intellectual property that transcends that and does not necessarily require the federal government's, uh, approval. Uh, on the, the hemp side of things, you're getting some more latitude at, at, at federal, you know, trademark registrations and things like that. But um, what I would encourage people to do is one for their for their trademarks, uh, protecting their logos and their brand names and things like that. Look to the state uh, uh, protection because I know at least on the West Coast, up and down the West Coast, there's um, plenty of ways you can you can file for protection in California or or, or wherever uh, related to 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 that, and it, it doesn't necessarily have the national national scope uh, that you would with federally, but it's better than being completely un unprotected. The other thing that I would encourage people to think about is um, that there's this concept called trade secrets, which um, does not require filing with the federal government to protect. Instead, it's the opposite of that. It's not about public disclosure and then protection by the government. It's about how well you keep your secrets to yourself and what sort of procedures you've put in place to protect them. You know, the classic example of that is sort of coats recipe for Coca-Cola or, you know, things like that. Uh, a lot of people are developing recipes for making products out of cannabis and, and things like that, but it, it can even be broader than that. It can include operating procedures and, you know, manufacturing procedures and things like that. So most of my clients, I really encourage them to focus on the trade secrets and putting into place the, um, the compliance mechanisms to make sure that your trade secrets are are protected uh, and, and defensible if they if they ever get challenged. So th that would be my recommendation: is sort of the the state approach for uh, for trademark protection, and uh, and then focus really heavily on on confidentiality and and trade secrets and, and and things like that. That's great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We're coming towards the end. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to give starting with Kevin. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a minute or so just to summarize or to just to say anything you would like to uh, say or anything you'd like to add to the conversation. Yeah, so 
in addition to sort of regulatory compliance, one of the things that I was surprised at when I got into this industry, um, and I'm on a number of boards, so you won't be able to tell which one I'm talking about. Um, it's certainly not talking about the public company uh, mm -hmm. because they're they're pretty organized in the corporate governance front, but there's this thing called corporate governance and, okay. and sort of having policies and procedures in the company. And I've been on a, the board of a public company before. I've been in a large Wall Street investment bank where they are, you know, have pretty good corporate governance. And one of the things that struck me as being odd and need, needing a lot of improvement is a lot of internal processes like making big investments, making big commitments are, are still done by the seat of people's pants uh, without uh, writing up you know, if you want to go buy something and it's, you know, $20 million, you know, people just kind of have a dinner and talk about it and they go buy the money, they go buy it. They don't necessarily have the money. They might have to go raise the money. Um, and what I'd like to see and what I'm encouraging and the companies I'm involved in is have an actual process where you write an investment up in an investment committee memo and you circulate that, you know, to senior management and to the board um, and you get all the brains looking at it and you get a formal approval uh, to spend anything over, you know, I don't know, a million dollars, 500,000, you know, the number can vary uh, depending on the circumstance of that company. Um, and they would also look at things like, you know, do we have this money in the bank or do we have to raise the money to actually fund that investment? Because you look back <laughs> at uh, 2019, most companies got themselves into a jam by, you know, there was this thing called the green rush. People went out and they were buying dispensaries with big notes that came due in a year or two uh, because they didn't have the money uh, or they were buying manufacturing facilities. I mean, you name it, very large numbers. And then when the capital market shut down and they shut down very quickly and very firmly, they were unable and basically uh, had big liquidity problems. Now, most companies worked their way out of that, but it was a very costly because typically you had to go to the party and negotiate with them and issue stock and cash, you know, to settle the obligation. So I'd like to see a lot more, a lot better corporate governance. And frankly, you can't go public until you get your house in order with respect to both regulatory and corporate governance, in my opinion. Agreed. Uh, we've seen already a few uh, disasters in the public sector. I won't name any companies that didn't get that part right. And uh, Ted, sorry to rush you a minute or so. If yep. you have anything you would like to add. I'll make it really quick. Uh, so first of all, the, I got to say, the number of times people come to me with handshake deals for million dollar, two million, $10 million <laughs> dollar investments is, is crazy. So like, please don't do that. You'll end up in our litigation department really fast if you do that. Um, but the second thing I wanted to say is I actually kind of want to answer the question that you asked Kevin before. And so now I'll, I'll just do that real fast. What, what are the trends and what's, what, what am I seeing in the industry? Usually when people ask me that, they, they're, they're expecting me to say like, oh, is processing or cultivation or, you know, uh, uh, retail or is, is that where it's headed? Where, where's the big, you know what I think? I, I think the things that both of you mentioned are really where the growth opportunities are. One, bringing professional man management to these industries of people who have experience in other industries who can bring that expertise here, who also understand and sort of get the social content and the benefits to the community of this. And so recruiting that sort of professional level expertise uh, I think is, 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 uh, is probably the biggest thing that, uh, that you can do. And then the second is, uh, uh, I, I do totally agree with sort of the corporate governance and, and, uh, you know, building the best board that you can around these companies as well, because, uh, the, 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 in order to grow and, and, and thrive, I think you need to do that. And I am also, I just want to echo one other point. I, I am actually seeing a huge trend towards consolidation in the industry. And I think that's kind of the next big play is a bunch of these fragmented uh, smaller businesses that have built, built a good reputation within the states that they're in because of the regulatory environments are going to start rolling into larger uh, umbrella companies and, and seeking liquidity on the capital markets that way. So anyway, <laughs> that's the real fast version, but thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> oh, no, that was excellent. And I'm going to very strongly suggest to Brad that you guys both be invited back. And I would love to do an extended panel if you so if you guys both feel so inclined, because 
to me, this is among the most 20 minutes and very extremely valuable 20 minutes just spending listening to you gentlemen. And, and I hope the audience appreciates the pearls of wisdom that you've cast to them. So anyways, time for me to move on back to the Dr. Dr. Dave, uh, <laughs> double PhD. And if you guys ever want some, uh, you in the audience, if you ever want to find out an interesting backstory, you should check out his bio. I mean, it's actually incredible. You know, Dave, Dr. Dave, you should really write a book about that someday. Anyways, over to you, Dave. I, I thank you so much, Sean. I really do appreciate the nice words. And uh, that is the goal one day in a couple more years. Um, also, John, I just want to say you did a great job monitoring that panel. And to the last two speakers, Ted and Kevin, thank you so much. Um, I also learned a lot as well, too. And I really think John hit the nail on the head. 20 minutes is just not enough time. And the information you gave was so insightful to so many people. And I really hope that people took down the notes. Uh, Kevin and Ted, just please make sure you check the qu question and answer part on the on bottom of your screen to make sure uh, if you have any case you have any questions. If you want to put any of your key uh, LinkedIn information or any other key contact information, please feel free to include it in the chat room. Uh, with that being said, we're gonna move on to our next panel. And our next panel, is, the topic is getting out of the weeds. Leveraging Star Power, Media Assets, and Strategic Partnerships in Cannabis. And this is a very hot topic because it's not as simple as people think uh, it is to get a celebrity to sit here and to endorse you or to be an influencer for you. There's really more to it. Um, and we have Dara Payne here of Cannabis Venture Partners, who is actually going to do his own intro. And Darren, I'll let you introduce uh, the, your panelists because you are the moderator. And we all look forward for you, uh, for all of us to learn a little bit more about what it takes to actually uh, leverage star power. Um, so the floor is yours, Darren. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the intro, David. Uh, once again, my name is Darian Payne. I am the COO or Chief Operating Officer here at CVP. That's Cannabis Venture Partners. Um, just a quick high level about CVP. What we are is, uh, what our mission is, is to help our clients win big in the cannabis industry. We help them by navigating uh, their, their potential pitfalls and also as well as ob observing their strengths and uh, capitalizing off of those sorts of things, um, as vague as that sounds. It's only because we have a expert in almost every realm of cannabis working um, as a departmental head to help us to uh, navigate these kind of treacherous waters. Um, we, give me just a moment. We work with executive leadership corporate structuring, business development, leveraging technology, which happens to be my personal favorite, accounting and finance, government consulting and community advocacy, another very strong point for us, strategic partnership development, what we're talking about today, marketing and branding, also something we're gonna speak on today, operations and licensing. These are just some of the offerings that CVP has out there. Um, now today, what we're speaking on most specifically is uh, leveraging star power, media assets, and strategic partnerships in cannabis. And I wanted to uh, say, uh, give a little bit of applause to David for mentioning that it's not as simple as throwing out the person that's on a Wheaties box and expecting them to be able to sell a product. Um, the marketing landscape has changed in general across the board, and that way of advertising and selling products has gone. Um, and it's gone even further away uh, from cannabis. You can't take a Wheaties approach. Um, you need to have these actual connections, strong relationships, and an understanding of these niche core groups that you're looking to sell to. Um, I come from a film background, and we always say niches get riches. So the ability to observe these things and to capitalize on data, marketing data, uh, purchasing, any sort of specific data that we can isolate and, and extract information from, um, is, is perfect for what we do and it allows us to help our clients so much better. So without any more uh, ado, I'm going to kick it over to Cletus Mack, who is our CEO, but more than that, he is a friend and mentor, but he's also a Grammy nominated legendary rapper. He's, uh, he's multi-platinum selling uh, a rapper as well. And he helps us uh, to communicate and to work on our strategic partnerships with a multitude of different clients in both the entertainment world and athletics, as well as politics and policy. So 
without any further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Cletus Mack, who is sitting near me. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing today? Pleasure to be here. Just wanted to talk to y'all about the difference of having a celebrity ambassador and an influencer. Now, what we do with CVP, we don't just have an ambassador. Ambassador is somebody you bring in and say, hey, you put their name up. Hey, we have Snoop Dogg and he's a part of this and that and this and that. But you just see that picture, that one time picture and you see the stamp on the brand. And yeah, you, it works to a certain degree. But what we do is we bring in the celebrities. Like for me, myself, I go, I go as far as to be the CEO of a company and also bring the other celebrities along with me. And I make sure that they follow through all the way. So you might have a celebrity who is the name of something, but they're not posting it. They're not putting it on their IG. They're not hashtagging anything. And what we do with CVP is we make sure that they follow through the whole process. We make sure that everybody is totally invested in the whole process to make sure that the business side works. And it's not just a quick, green and go like it's the, the cannabis business doesn't work that way it's not something that you can just jump into and win you have to really know this business and what we did with this company in particular we put together strategically put together all of the places like far as uh real estate far as licensing far as celebrity every single thing that we need to do we put it all together to make sure that we are the go-to people and we have everything on board with us. So we're basically like the standard, like, and we're working with the biggest companies in the business right now, the biggest brands, and they are very comfortable with working with us because we're very consistent on what we do. And we make sure that we are consistently making sure that we work all the way through every single platform that it takes for this for this game. And a lot of times what we have, the problem is people end up being green on the green. And when you're green on the green, you don't really have the knowledge and the know-how to, to execute your next step. You could put a whole lot of money in this business and end up stuck. And that's what a lot of people end up face, facing. And what we do is we make sure that you never come in contact with that. We make sure that you feel educated all the way throughout the whole process. And also with the celebrities that we attach to you, we make sure that they are acting and not just a face. They are really working the product. They are really moving and treating it like their business because we make sure that they are a part of the business. And that's what, strategically, that's what we do to make sure that we can make sure separates us from everyone else pretty much. And with no further ado, Money B, are you involved? Are you here? Like the here, I'm here. Hey, you guys hear me? Yes, absolutely, sir. everybody. We got Money B coming in right now. Um, he is one of our management at managers and consultants at CVP. He is also a multi platinum selling artist. If you can't tell by that mean looking plaque section in the back of his room, there, <laughs> uh, he's also from the legendary rap group Digital Underground, uh, with the, which is great lineage. But more than that, I think Money B has a certain level of expertise when it, when it comes to speaking to both realms. Um, so without any more, I'd leave it to you, Money B. Please. Thank you, thank you, Darren. Hello, everyone. So you know, like Darian said, you know. The accolades, you know, Grammy nominated. We've sold tens of millions of of albums worldwide, and you know, I've been in the industry for thirty two years. But if you look around today, uh, Digital Underground is still relevant, and you can see it in our you know placement in the new Coming to America movie, um, men being mentioned in the television series Blackish, and it's not by accident, it's it's because, you know, we've, or I would say myself personally, you know, through all aspects of our career, I've kind of been hands-on, you know, and cultivated the relationships. So, you know, with um, CVP, I'm not just an ambassador or a face of the, of the company, you know, I'm actually, you know, a part of the company. So, you know, I'm not just going to be the guy that's, like you said, I'm not the guy in the Wheaties box. I'm actually doing the work. 
And there's nothing like uh, taking a business call about Digital Underground with Digital Underground. And that's, that's what I do. You know, I, I'm in the trenches. I'm gonna do everything that it takes to, to, to close it and, and get it done. Um, you know, I've managed the Digital Underground brand for several years, uh, had been a part of and, and, and have managed, you know, video production companies and been involved in film, marketing, commercial, stage, everything like that. So I feel like, you know, I'm perfect to help um, facilitate and fulfill your needs when it comes to, to new media. You know, I actually sit on the board for a streaming company called Buyer Streaming Network. Um, it's fairly new, but it's in 116 countries and we have 13 niche channels. We're also launching a um, channel and platform specific, specifically catering towards cannabis and hemp products called Cannavid TV. Um, and it's so much is it fair to say that you understand quite well how to create your own opportunities as well as leverage what already exists in the market of the, the traditional ways of marketing these products? Yeah, because, you know, I, I, paying attention, like, you know, sometimes you can just, like you said, if I was only willing to lend my name and just say, hey, go ahead and paste my picture there. Anything that I get involved with, I research and I find out exactly how that company or how that process works. So, you know, if, if I go in the room and you start asking me questions, I know <laughs> about the business that I'm promoting. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm fully uh, abreast of the operation and not just the uh, cosmetics of anything that I do. So, you know, like I said, with, uh, with um, Vire and Cannabit, you know, we, we welcome, you know, the cannabis community. Obviously, Cannabit TV is, is specifically for, but even at Vire, you know, the, the um, product placement and the ad and marketing opportunities are endless. Um, and I know, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I'm not sure if David Hill, who's actually the co-owner of a uh, buyer and candidate if he's if he's on david are you there yes i am how, how, how's everybody doing can you hear me yes we're doing great welcome david we can Thank hear you, you. so i, I kind of wanted dave to really quick talk about uh another aspect of what we do which is cash crop today dave you want to jump in on that yeah so around three years ago we created a, a media platform called cash crop today media um, also, I'm working closely with uh, Darren, Cletus, and uh, Money B uh, within regard to this. Um, we created the business side of what cannabis and hemp is, growing um, stocks, uh, raising funds, um, basically like a whole, whole resource. Uh, currently, right now, cashcroptoday.com, everybody can go download it or log on to it. Um, we have around 600,000 people that read that website a month. Um, it talks about all the publicly traded companies uh, that are in cannabis, who's high, who's low. Uh, we have a bunch of society, different levels of societies that, uh, and communities that, you know, we have some services that go along with what Cletus, Darren, and uh, Money B are saying. And also we have new shows that we're building out for Cannabis TV. Uh, the website is cashcroptoday.com. Uh, uh, for the person that was just in the chat that said, uh, what's the website again? Um, yeah, so realistically, you know, marketing cannabis brands, it's a, it's a tough thing to do nowadays, especially with all the rules. Um, you know, you can't do regular Facebook uh, targeted marketing, Instagram target marketing. You have to be real careful, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be more creative. Uh, partnering with uh, talent influencers uh, that actually control those Instagram posts, et cetera, et cetera, more so is so important. As well as if you are a company that is public on the OTC markets, OTB markets, um, doing curated content, 
um, curated articles, uh, being on multiple different platforms, or just building up that community. Um, currently, we've built a community of uh, 72,000 uh, emails and people that's actually engaging with Cash Crop today, uh, not to mention the 600,000 people that uh, read it per month. And we're growing out. We have uh, one coming up in April um, called Foodie Dispensary. Foodie Dispensary is all foods, meaning we already have over 300 uh, different recipes on how to cook, um, how to cook with cannabis, all the way from gourmet meals to snacks for events and parties. And we have another platform that we're cultivating right now, curating uh, right now is about growth. And it goes from the agriculture to the farming, to all of that type of stuff like that. So definitely we have various different places that we can plug into any companies and everything. And we have a history of doing it for 22 years. Not to cut you off, um, that's great information. We've got Dave's uh, website and info pinged in there. And you could also get in contact with anybody from CBP to further this discussion. But we are coming close on time and we've got one last well, two, two last guests, but one special, very, very special guest to, to have speak here. He's the co-founder and owner of Leaves of Legends, a cannabis brand and a two-time Grammy winning artist and multi-platinum selling artist from the, from the group Bone Thugs and Harmony. As a Cleveland native, I consider him one of the greats and uh, I'm quite a fan and he's a great mentor as well as co-founder. Give it up everybody for Crazy Bone. Welcome him. And I'm going to leave the floor to him. Uh, Craig, please take it. Yeah, man, best. I'm gonna be real quick. You know what I'm saying? First of all, thanks for bringing me back to this forum. You know what I'm saying? I had a good time last time, and uh, it's good to be back in behalf of League of Legends. Shout out to everybody over here that I, you know what I'm saying, that I'm used to seeing on a daily basis. Money B, Cletus Mack, Darian, Liz, you know what I'm saying? The whole team, whole squad, Joseph, what's happening? Um, just want to let everybody know, you know, that Leagues of Legend is a is a it's a premium cannabis brand and our main focus is you know on the culture and the community just to be real short uh when i say that i have a i have a partnership with the cleveland school of cannabis and um we have a scholarship program to where we help to uh, we, we we choose minorities or people from the community where i'm from back in cleveland and uh you know we we, we give them a free scholarship and put them through this program to give them knowledge of the whole cannabis industry and have them learn, you know, like the different techniques or whatever it is, you know, grower or owner dispensaries. They, they get all this knowledge, you know, so they'll be able to go out and work in the work in this field. This uh very, very rising very rapidly, you know what I'm saying? So um also um I'm excited to announce that uh, you know, in in anticipation for 420, we are launching our cannabis brand in other states. And we're like growing very rapidly right now in collaborations with cookies as well. You know, stay moving into different areas with with like Oklahoma and Washington and Colorado. Um, also, I have an album coming out entitled Leaves of Legend. You know, it's kind of like the soundtrack for the cannabis. You know what I'm saying? So while you indulge it in the cannabis, you got a soundtrack to play along with it. You know what I'm saying? I'm giving you everything you need for that. You know what I'm saying? And um. You know, the whole album is dedicated, it's, it's, it's 12 songs on the album, basically signature cannabis songs. If you're a Bone Thugs and Harmony fan, then you know how much we have been advocates of uh, cannabis throughout our career. We always dedicated songs or two or three to cannabis on each project. Um, and so the, uh, the album is dedicated to the cannabis culture band and got a lot of classic songs on there. So before I get up out of here, just want everybody, let y'all know we are looking to raise capital for capital for what we're doing. You know, we're looking for strategic and, um, investors and partners. Uh, this is a great opportunity to come and, you know, like be a part of what we're doing. Because, like I said, we're reaching back into the community. We're, we're doing charitable events and everything. Like, basically giving back. That's something I really never seen any cannabis brands do. But like giving back to the community and for the people that really risk their lives and, you know, like put in work to like bring this to the mainstream. I feel like a lot of this money should be going back to the people that were penalized for using this for so many years, you know, and, and of course we help bring this to the mainstream. So it's only right. So that's all I wanted to say. Like I said, thank you all for having me and uh, 
yeah. If y'all are interested in, a, you know what I'm saying, talking to us about the brand, get at me or get at like any one of these people you see on here, Money B, Darian, Cletus, anybody you see on here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you, you, you mentioned coming on as well too. Um, we, got, we got about 30 seconds left. So, so Darian, let me ask you this. In the last ahead, 30 sir. seconds, what do you want to tell the audience here today? Yeah. What, what I'd like to say is that the marketing in cannabis can be tricky. It can be treacher, treacherous, conventional. Sorry, Darian. Sorry, sorry, Darian. I, I do. Let, let's have Liz close us out. Sorry about that. Right. We, we have Liz and our, our esteemed attorney partner, who's also a civil rights activist. You know, there's uh, she's on the front lines of social equity and doing all kinds of amazing things. Liz, why don't you close us out? Please. All right, thank you for that. And I'm sorry, Darian. Um, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. I already, I just wanted to say social equity is so important. It's a huge piece in cannabis investing. And if morals is not uh, the only thing that drives you, uh, there's just two reasons why you should care about social equity before we close out this group today. And it's that the strategic partnerships and social equity will make your business robust. Um, there is no business that won't benefit from making sure that you form those strategic partnerships throughout the communities that are underserved uh, by the criminalization of cannabis. Um, and the fact that you promoting the legalization, and we have a lot of work to do to continue uh, legalizing this business, uh, is only going to increase the eligibility for business partners and the market. Um, and secondly, and I know uh, Mr. Ted Bernhard uh, spoke to this already, but the compliance will make or break your business or at least uh, cause you to miss opportunities. So if nothing else, the compliance aspect of making sure that um, your business is compliant with all licensing requirements um, is the second benef uh, benefit to making sure that you are caring about social equity. So I don't wanna take up too much of more of your time, but thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, for listening to our panel. And Liz, thank you so much for bringing that up as well too, because social equity is, is very important. Um, everyone, uh, all our panels, please make sure you look at the, the question and answer part. I know, uh, we just had uh, someone give a question for John Nemanic from, from the previous panel. Uh, Darian, Joseph, uh, Liz, I see y'all already put your information in the chat room. Feel free to do it again. And honestly, it's all about helping each other around this community and, and really thinking about the bigger picture overall. Uh, very powerful stuff. Thank you so much for being on. And we're gonna move on to our, our last panel discussion before we go on to the investor pitch deck competition. So the last panel topic is how is a government grant funded project assisting minority businesses? And I myself actually, uh, Dr. David will be the moderator for this. Um, very quick background about myself. If you're just joining us, doctor of physical therapy, doctor of healthcare management, been in Canvas since 2009, seven different Canvas companies in five different states. Um, so that's really important today is that uh, the people to our, our speakers that we have today are actually part of NABEDSI, which is funded by the United States Department of Congress. Um, <clears throat> the Bureau of Minority Business, uh, which is, I'm sorry, funded by the United States Department of Commerce, Bureau of Minority Business Development Agency. And their goal is to provide no cost business development services to American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians located in Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and the Navajo Nation. Uh, their direct services include resources for starting and or growing your business, assessing capital, and locating and bidding on opportunities, market resources, export assistance, manufacturing resources, and other services as well too. Um, with that being said, we have several people here today who are panelists. So I would, uh, we have Eugene Robinson, Javari Starks, Carolyn Graves, and Peter Swartz. Uh, because of our time limit, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to start with Eugene Robinson, and if y'all could just give a 45 second introduction about yourself and your background. So we'll start with Eugene first, and then we'll go uh, proceed with Giovanni next. Hey, how you doing? Can you Great, hear me? Eugene. You got, you got 45 seconds to do an intro, introduction on, uh, on yourself and on your background for the audience, please. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Eugene Robinson. I am the co-founder and COO of Midwest Buds, uh, located in uh, Arizona. 
Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in supply chain, uh, financial services, um, and uh, working with, I, I was uh, working with Intel, um, running their global supply chain uh, for a couple of years, and um, also worked on in the commercial space doing small businesses for uh, companies like uh, Bank of America and Chase. Um, so that's a little bit about me, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more as we go along in the uh, process here. Oh, can you not see me? He's muted. I, I, I can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. I would say, is, uh, is Giovanni with us today? As yeah, as Giovanni's here as well. Is Giovanni... Uh, is I will say both you guys are completely blacked out with the way you got the sun behind you, but we can see you fine. To see, oh, you know, we, so, so no, it's all good. So, uh, so Giovanni, uh, in 45 seconds, let's talk about uh, your background, please. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Giovanni Starks. I am the CEO of Midwest Buds. I have over 15 years of sales experience, management and coaching. Uh, I used to be a supervisor for McKesson Specialty Health. Uh, also, I am a up and coming music artist in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and that's pretty much my background. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater uh, with a degree in physical education, pre-law and coaching. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's, that's the nail. That's the nail in the coffin for me. You know, perfect. You did that in 39 seconds, my friend. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask Karen Lynn Graves, who's a project director of Nabisi, to give a 45 second background uh, on yourself first, please. Thank you. You're, you're muted, Karen. I'm not now. Yep. Karen Lynn Graves. I'm the project director for Nabedsi. So um, in my role, just overseeing activities, grant funded activities, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Peter Schwartz. And Peter, why don't you go next and, 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 and end up with us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, my background has uh, been in government uh, my whole life. Um, I've been working in Indian country for about 25 years with economic development, job creation, um, and helping them assist to uh, get into the cannabis and hemp industry. Um, and so, and Midwest Buzz is one of our clients and, and we're here to support them. Great. And, and I appreciate you both being here. And I think this is great for everyone that is listening and attending from all around the world that Midwest Buzz is, is a client uh, of Nabedsi. So I know this is a very loaded topic and I know we only have about 15 minutes or so. So I, I like to ask this first question to Karen and to Peter directly. And this first question is this, could you list an example uh, of a funded project by, uh, by the government that's assisting minority businesses? And can you tell us um, how the project came about pretty much um, and what your role was in that? And if we could answer it within about four minutes so we can ask a couple more questions, that'd be great. Sure, so let me start with how Nabedsi got started. That'd be um awesome. Okay, so about four or five years ago, the US Department of Commerce Bureau of Minority Business Development started hearing a lot of talks in the background from different communities about not getting the services that they were looking for. So more specifically, our American Indians, Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians. So the MBDA did what's referred to as a tribal consultation and started getting feedback to find out what could we do a little bit different. So what, we, what came as a result of that was we need to have more presence. So there was a, an, a grant opportunity that went out and our office, and we, we are operated or overseen by the um, Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We went after this grant and we were able to receive it. So essentially what we do under our grant, we call it Nabedsi, but we provide business development services. So that's everything from helping to find money, different types of loan, investment opportunities, to just um, business education from startup and beyond. So more specifically with ours, we ended up serving um, veterans, our youth, women, um, immigrants, uh, uh, disabled individuals, a whole gamut of, of different services that we're providing to all. So essentially, again, it all stems under MBDA for Minority Business Development Agency. Great, and then so, for, and you said that uh, Eugene and uh, Giovanni, they're clients of yours, correct? They are clients of ours. And so could you do this really quick um, for the audience? Um, 
did you find them or did they find you? And like, how that interaction go? Like, tell tell our audience, like, how do they find out about uh, about N- Nabetsi and how that whole interaction went through? That'd be great. So, so they are clients, uh, direct clients of Peter's, and I'm going to go ahead and let Peter explain how how we found each other. So, so Midwest Buzz, they reached out to us and and, and explained what they were trying to get into the hemp industry with the legalization that was coming up of it. Uh, and they were already into the cannabis industry uh, and just asked for our help and advice on, on how to do things. So um, obviously with the government, you know, that's each state is different what they have. Um, and so we're trying to help them uh, get into the underprivileged areas, the uh, opportunity zones, these type of things to uh, conduct their business to help in the rural areas. And then we're here, of course, here to support them and, and with yep. trying to find investors and these type of things. If, if, so, I, if, if I may, I'm sorry, let me add one more piece to this because we got to, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're connecting the dots. Another thing that we're assisting them with is relationships with different tribes. We know that we need to have economic development, you know, activities within our different tribal communities and what better way than having their product. So it's not a secret that, you know, you may have hemp, you may have cannabis, but you also have the wraparound services. We have agriculture companies who provide, you know, um, you know, different fertilizers. I mean, you have packaging. It's a whole lot of different services that are provided. So, but we're honored, like I shared, to have them as our clients. So we're able to help connect those dots with them. So, so Eugene, and um, my question to you is, Eugene, um, what are what were the first steps that you took with with the bed C? Um, the first step uh, that we took was uh, reaching out to see what type of services they can help us with. Um, and then we sat down with Peter, um, who's an awesome guy, and uh, kind of like you said, laid out our uh, you know our process and what we were looking to do. And um, he has. Um, helped us out with uh, relationships, um, like Karen said, um, with the Indian tribes uh, out, actually out here in Nevada. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, those talks kind of slowed down. So we're hoping to get those ramped back up this year. Um, and yeah, just getting us into spaces that a lot of other companies can't get into otherwise. And and I don't I don't, don't know if you said this to the audience. How long have you been working with Peter for Peter and Karen for? Um, Peter, what three years? Two About and a half years, years? Three years? Three years? Oh, great. So so let me ask you guys then both and and Karen or Peter, you can answer this question first. Is what would be Peter and Karen for people that should be reaching out to you? What would be like the top three things they should think about? about the bed C and say, wait, we should call Peter and Karen. Number one, if you're looking, if you are looking to even get started in any type of business industry, I would say connect with us. If you're so industry for, agnostic then, correct? Industry agnostic. Perfect. We are open to absolutely everyone. We help everyone. Um, the other thing too is capital. We know all businesses need money. That's why we have this cannabis investment forum today. They need money. Um, the other thing is those connections and those relationships. That's one thing that our office is known for is knowing how to connect those dots to different industry professionals, even by way of you, by way of our, our partner here, Roderick, with us today, just utilizing those different relationships so we can help connect the dots. So those are our top three things that we can do. Okay, great. And, and Eugene and Giovanni, uh, what would you like to add on top of that as well, too, if anything that Karen just said? Uh, for us, what I think I would like to add is that uh, working with Nabetsi uh, has given us an opportunity, like my business partner said, to get into those opportunity zones and speak with these tribal leaders on another level. Uh, especially in Arizona, we all know, like, kind of like the, the casino industry is dying in Arizona. It's not a whole lot of it. Uh, so with those people, they have to figure out other ways to generate revenue. Uh, and coming into their area, uh, being able to provide a quality product that can either help with uh, quality building materials, uh, educating them on uh, the uses of cannabis and the uses of hemp and what it can all do uh, as far as making affordable building material, hemp, concrete, whatever. 
it's something that they can uh, definitely grasp onto and make money outside of the casino industry. Uh, and at the same time, we can provide services to other Arizonians that may be looking for job, assisting with inmates coming out of prison and stuff like that. It's just a wide range of us trying to help everyone around us and, su and succeed at the best. Great. Now, we, we do have about eight minutes left. And, and uh, Nabetsi, I, I probably is a very new concept to a lot of people on this call and at this event right now. It's also probably new to a lot of investors and accredited investors that we have here listening. So, so Karen and Peter, um, I'd like to give you the floor for the next three or four minutes to really talk more about Nabetsi, how people can find you, interact with you, how you can deal with investors as well too. So I, I'd like to kind of give you an open forum for three or four minutes and then I'll cut you off because I'll have one last question for everyone, all right? Okay, I definitely, we definitely appreciate that. So the first way to get a hold of us is by our website, nabedsi.com. So www.nabedc.com has all of our information on there. Specifically on the investor side, for those who are looking to invest and they want to, you know, they can come to us, we can help again, make those different connections to the people that we're working with. Right now, currently we're working with the company that does Humate. So that's a natural fertilizer so we can get them connected. Um, Peter, you wanna add on to that? Yeah, the, the Humate is actually something that uh, NASA is going to be using to uh, send up to the moon. Um, it's, it's a natural fertilizer. It comes from the coal uh, part of it, um, and it comes out of the Navajo Nation uh, in New Mexico. Other services, and you mentioned them earlier on, you know, we, we have our, of course, our elevator pitches, everybody, so I'll, I'll kind of tone it down just a little bit. But again, back to the money, back to the wraparound services, we even assist with marketing, helping with websites, um, helping with e getting emails set up. And we're gonna talk to our friends here in a second about that as well. But we just wanna make sure that our clients are always putting their best foot forward. Our overarching goal, if you will, is economic development, all these different communities that we're serving. So at the end of the day, you know, if you have someone who is, you know, um, like, our, like our clients here who are, you know, with cannabis and everything else, we want to make sure that we get packaging people involved, artists involved, website developers involved. We want to get as many people involved to help that company. We believe you cannot do things on your own. It takes a community to lift everybody up. So that's pretty much our philosophy within the Betsy. And again, we do serve, you know, our American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiians, but we serve all minorities because essentially at the end of the day, we're all helping each other. And, and Karen, I don't think you said it. How many years has Nabetsi been around for? We've only been around for two years since 2019. And so my background kind of mirrors Peter's a little bit in that I also come from a government background. So I used to work for a, a Governor Napolitano's, one of her projects in Arizona. Um, so, I mean, we, we come from a very unique background in terms of business development services. So I've been doing business and professional development services for more than 25 years now. Great. And, I, and, and I've been working with uh, under grants with the Minority Business Development Agency for about 13 years now. And if, if I'm correct, um, you, you all help people uh, all throughout all 50 states. That's correct? That is correct. Excellent. And now uh, we, we do have a couple minutes left. And, and Eugene and Giovanni, for if you all been working with Peter and Karen for a while, could you please talk about the experience you've had or uh, any words of encouragement for back. other listeners here okay. today, other people that are trying that need the help of of Nabetsi? Could you could you give some 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 a little bit of insight, maybe some words of encouragement? Yeah. Uh, so that'd be great. Yeah, uh, working with Nabetsi, one thing that we've learned uh, as partners is that uh, you got to have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed when you come to Nabetsi. Uh, you have to have a plan of attack. Uh, you can't go in it blindly. Uh, you have to know where you want to execute, where you want to, what areas you want to touch, and what you need them to do. So you have to have a concise plan so that you can direct uh, Nabetsi as to what you need. And I think me and my business partner, our, ourselves, we've, we've kind of put it in their hands with helping us with getting into these uh, meetings with uh, tribal uh, leaders and stuff like that, which has been a very insightful because then we get to learn about what their struggles are, what their pain points are. Uh, and then where we can come in to alleviate those pain points and try to generate revenue for them and their people as well. You want to touch on it a little bit? Yeah, no, just to kind of piggyback off that, um, 
like Giovanni said, uh, they've opened up doors, um, you know, that no one else can open up. So um, we're pretty much one of one in the industry right now because we're the only ones that are backed by a uh, government agency like this. So it's pretty rare to have an agency like this to, uh, you know, to have your back. And, and uh, we're very grateful for the relationship that we've uh, created with them. And, and I will say just for myself, as an investor and as someone that represents many investors, um, I think this is great and I'm happy y'all were here today because never heard of the Betsy. Didn't know that was even around. Um, and at our, own, at our own company, UCS Advisors, we, we do get a lot of phone calls um, for, for people that need help, need assistance, and looking for, for other programs that can assess, uh, help them assess some. And what I'm hearing a lot is also a lot, of, kind of like Karen and Peter, you guys are doing also a lot of mentorship. Which Absolutely. Is so That's... important in this industry. Um, yes. I know we only have two minutes left. So the first thing I'm going to say is please make sure you put your information in the chat room. Okay. Okay. Please make sure people can see that. I saw a few people pop up asking for last names, asking for contact information. Also, please make sure you check the question and answer because I believe there's one or two questions already popped up for y'all. Okay. And with that being said, Karen and Peter, for the last 90 seconds, the floor is yours. What is the, the lasting message you want to leave the audience here today? The lasting message, come to us for all business development services. That's the lasting message. We can provide connections and wraparound services. We don't pretend to know everything, but like I said earlier, we have those connections so we can help people, um, you know, make sure that they get connected in industry. So we would appreciate it if you have any questions whatsoever about business development, specifically even now in the cannabis industry and what we can do to provide services, wraparound support for you, let us know. And we'll be sure to make sure we answer. I see all the questions too, and um, we'll certainly put all of our information in there. And then uh, Eugene and Giovanni, you have any, any last parting words for the audience at all? Yeah, we need money. <laughs> we need investment money. <laughs> well, well, I will say this, and I'm going to take a message out of John Demanic, and I'm going to take a message from Matt Norgren, is that remember, you need to be prepared. And what we tell Definitely. all our clients here at UCS Advisors, failure to plan is planning to fail. Definitely. And you really need to always think those three or four steps ahead. Peter and Karen, thank you so much. To, and thank you for introducing this entire crowd of over 250 plus participants to let them be educated about Nevetsi. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you uh, very uh, much. Midwest Buds, wishing you all the best of luck. Keep, keep up the good work. And that wraps up the end of our panel selection. So once again, thank you so much. The very next part <clears throat> we're gonna be moving on to is our investor pitch deck competition. I hope everyone enjoyed all the speakers today. Hope everyone had their, their questions answered. I hope there were some good contacts that were made. Please don't forget that after the investor pitch part, there's actually a Zoom meeting to do even more networking, which is key. Because one of the big thing about this cannabis and hemp industry, it's all about networking. It's about making contacts and building relationships. So with that being said, I'm now going to reintroduce the infamous John Demanic, who's <laughs> going to be your moderator today for the Investor Pitch Deck competition. I'll be back with you after the winners are announced after the competition, as well as some other announcements about some upcoming information. For the Investor Pitch Deck competition, if you missed out before, John Numanic has a very deep background. He has a background not only as an investor, but also as an entrepreneur. He also has, has started several companies, increased the value of those companies, and sold them. He has been in the front lines with other entrepreneurs, with our people who are presenting here, building companies, raising capital, and then selling companies. He understands the game. Another really key thing about John, which makes him a very great moderator, is that he has both international and domestic experience. Because if you think campus is just in Canada or just in the, in the USA, you are dead mm. wrong. Canvas is a worldwide agriculture product. It's not going anywhere, it is here to stay. And with that note, I'm gonna introduce John Demanic. Uh, I'll to you introduce the other investor judges. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, Dave, thank you so much. You know, you're really kind and I appreciate your wonderful introduction. As Dave stated, I am the moderator for the investor pitch competition. I'd like to welcome everyone that has joined us today from 36 countries, 
five continents, like, wow, really? Cannabis is a global movement. Cannabis is medicine. We have seven investor judges with stellar backgrounds and are joined by additional investors and sources of capital watching from around the world. We have eight companies that will present today to the judges and where they were selected from over 40 companies that applied. We have assembled a great cross section of companies that will be presenting today that include both, both private companies and publicly traded companies. So let's start by going over today's schedule and the format of the investor pitch competition. The investor pitch competition will be approximately two hours long and our goal is to educate investors about cannabis, CBD, and hemp investment opportunities and connect companies from different industry sectors who are seeking additional growth capital and in the hunt for new investors and sources of capital. Today, we will watch eight innovative companies present to their investment opportunity to a panel of experienced investor judges that are seeking investment opportunities. At the end of the eight presentations, we will learn which companies the investor judges like and if they're motivated to invest. The schedule for today's webinar is as follows. From 1.05 p.m., that's Pacific time, to 1.20 p.m., I will start with the introductions of the investor judges. From 1.20 p.m. to 3.03 p.m., we will have company presentations and question and answer from the investor judges. From 3.03 p.m. to 3.15 p.m., we will have voting by the investor judges and you, the audience, will have an opportunity to vote for the company that gave the best presentation. The judges will each vote for one company and tell us why this is their choice. We will add up the judges' votes to come up with a total and the company that has the most individual judges' votes will be the overall winner of the investor pitch competition. We will announce the investor judges and audience winner. From 3.15 p.m. to 3.20 p.m., we will have a closing announcement by me, John Nomadic. To close out the day from 3.20 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., we will be hosting a Zoom room networking, different from this room, Zoom room networking, where you can meet the presenting companies, investor judges, and meet the webinar audience. I really suggest you hang around and go into that event. It's a great place to network. We have a few webinar items to cover. First, if you wanna submit a question, just use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure you're chatting with all panelists and attendees. After the final presentation, the webinar audience will be presented with a pop-up window on your computer where you'll be able to vote for your number one company presentation. To the presenting companies and speakers, I will work to give, bring you questions from the audience. We also recommend that you monitor the chat to answer questions directed to you. As a reminder, you can have access to the presenting companies and the investor judges information and contact information at the Cannabis Investing Forum website, www cannabisinvestingforum.com. I'll repeat that, www.cannabisinvestingforum, all one word, dot com. Now, format an investor pitch competition. Each company will receive 12 minutes to present and answer questions by judges. Moderator, that's me, will introduce each presenting company. It has rec been recommended that the companies use six minutes of time for presentations and allow six minutes of Q&A from judges. I will be strict with time limits. Judges will raise their hands and indicate if they want to ask a question. Please also send me a private message. And I apologize sincerely in advance if I miss any of your questions. Judges are requested to have one question for each presentation and to keep answers at 90 seconds or less so that we can have three to four investor judges ask questions for each presentation. I will proceed in alphabetical order by first name. And from there, I will give each judge one minute or less to introduce themselves. So I'd like to start with Carol Ortega Algara, 
Managing Director, Moiska Capital Group. Carol, please take it away. Give us a one minute or less introduction about yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Ortega. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, John, for, for putting together this amazing networking. Um, I'm representing family offices, angel investors, and in general terms, uh, accredited investors from Latin America. We are interested in companies that are post-revenue, so you need to have some historical income already in your financial statements. We are interested in companies that are already listed in, in under the SEC, uh, United States Securities Exchange Commission. And we are also interested in companies that are looking to um, do their IPO this year. So if you have those three requirements, feel free to contact us at info at muiscacg.com. Thank you. That's great, Carol. And by the way, for any of you that don't, don't know who Carol is, she, if you want to do anything in Colombia in the cannabis space, I would strongly suggest you start with her. She knows anybody who's worth knowing in the sector. Now, on to Cletus Mack, CEO, Cannabis Venture Partners. Cletus, please take it away. Hello, Cletus Mack. I don't hear you. You're muted. Okay, let's go to the next judge and then I'll introduce Cletus later. Uh, David Cram, co-founder and managing director, Profarian Sapling. Hey guys. David, please take it away. Awesome, thank you. Um, very lucky to be here today. Really appreciate ev everyone showing up. I'm actually located in Las Vegas today, but I live in Los Angeles. Um, I, like you said, I'm the co-founder and managing director of Profirian Sapling. Basically, we are a real estate investment firm that helps cannabis companies acquire and build out facilities. What we always like to say is the value of a cannabis company is not necessarily just in its license. It's also in its real estate because without real estate, there is no company. So we help companies find real estate, buy it and lease it back to them. We also invest um, and help advise plant touching companies and run investment syndicates for companies looking to raise capital. So we're not just a real estate firm. We will also look at deal flow for up and coming and emerging plant touching businesses from coast to coast. I've been in cannabis for seven years. I'm a former Wall Street analyst that luckily left the world of Wall Street to do this much more exciting industry. Yeah. Um, and I haven't looked back since. So I really appreciate everyone for joining us today. And if you have any questions um, about raising capital, investing, um, or preparing to raise capital, feel free to get in touch. I'll post a link to my LinkedIn on the chat. That's great, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Oh, listen, good to see you. First time I've seen you here. I've done a few of these events. Welcome. Thank you so now, much. Oh, my pleasure. David Wise, chairman and founder of Infinity. David, please take it away. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I come into the industry since 2017. Uh, Infinity was formed at, primarily as a bulk distributor to supply uh, the, the needs of the brands and manufacturers in order to create their products. Um, we're here today because we're always interested in uh, acquisitions that make sense that augment our current business model, which is uh, distribution based. Uh, one of the areas that we are exploring even more are those looking to create brands. So we'd be primarily interested in companies that uh, have a brand that they've developed, but are seeking to expand it, especially in the California market where we are a licensed distributor. Uh, we are also expanding into the state of Illinois and are waiting for those licenses to be issued as we become a multi-state operator. Uh, Carol, you and I may want to talk sometime because we are, we're also purchasing a Colombian company. In the meantime, you know, my background, people call me Dr. D because I have a PhD in organizational leadership and management. Uh, my master's in business, as well as a law degree, uh, primarily transactional based. So I look forward to hearing from all the panelists and hopefully asking some thought provoking uh, questions that help them move forward or at least uh, get them on the table for investments. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, FYI, as you probably already know, I'm also invested in Columbia as well in the Canada space. So 
On to Dr. John Thompson, founder and CEO, Extract Lab. Uh, Dr. John, please take it away. Um, you may be muted. How's that? Better. <laughs> yeah. My sign right. language is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so there's a little bit of an echo here, but I think it should be able to, uh, to do this. No problem. So uh, my name is Dr. John Thompson. Um, I'm founder and CEO of Extract Lab and uh, United Science. Uh, we've put hundreds and hundreds of people into the businesses of uh, hemp and cannabis. And, um, you know, the, the feedback is terrible. <laughs> Hang on just a second. If I can get that. Um, yeah, so uh, we put uh, hundreds of people into the business of um, basically, um, you know, building out products for the marketplace. And uh, it's been a very rewarding time. We started in 2014. And uh, my company has built up uh, uh, about 10 different equipment brands. Uh, we do consulting for the entire industry. Um, our company is always looking for the latest and greatest in technology. I know there's some technology companies here. Um, we're doing a lot of investments right now in medical packaging, single use medical packaging. Um, and we, we also have uh, a tremendous number of clients that we deal with. Um, a lot of the big co corporations up in Canada, for example, the public companies, um, we put a lot of those guys into the extraction business. Um, and uh, of course, there's always, uh, there's always a cross-pollination between you know, technologies. They're looking for a lot of those medical technologies as well. So um, I have uh, a PhD in analytical chemistry. That's my background. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've just been really at the grassroots of the industry. Um, I was co-founder of Vireo Health, which is a current state uh, multi-state operator. Um, they're operating in uh, several uh, states right now. And, um, and that's really my background. So I'm very interested in hearing all the presentations today and, uh, and good luck to all the um, pitchers. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I called you Dr. John earlier in the Latin style, which is we refer with an honor with a honorific. We always start with the first name. I think I've been down here too long, you know, lots of cervezas, that's for sure. Um, on to Ted Bernhardt. Pleasure speaking with you again, Managing Director Cultiva Law. Yep. Ted, pleasure. please take it away. Thank you. Pleasure speaking to you again as well. Uh, as you may have seen on my earlier introduction, uh, Ted Bernhard, Managing Director of Cultiva Law. Cultiva Law is a uh, cannabis-only business law firm uh, in the West Coast, uh, up and down from Seattle, Portland, where I am, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, our primary Client base is entrepreneurs in the space and investors uh, as well. Um, a lot of the the, the uh, people come to us looking for uh, investment opportunities, ranging from angel investors to venture capital, private equity, uh, later stage investing, real estate, all that sort of stuff. So uh, I'm primarily a service provider, but uh, a lot of our clients are uh, invested in this space and. Like I said before, before I um, practiced law, I actually was was a partner in in, in four different uh, investment funds as well. So, um, looking forward to the presentations today, and thanks for inviting me. A pleasure to have you here, believe me. And now on to uh, Zach Bernion or Bergon. I apologize if I butchered your name in French. I would say it's Bergnon. Uh Real estate acquisitions, cannabis venture partners. Zach. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I apologize. I think my background was wrong. But anyways, I am the chief of real estate for cannabis fit biz venture partners, um, specializing in license acquisition sales, real estate sales, um, kind of anything to do with the real estate and licensing side of cannabis. Um, we're mostly looking for cannabis companies that are looking for funding or need joint venture partners to come in and assist them. 
That's great, Zach. By the way, just an FYI, um, your background, um, I'm not seeing you clearly You're having a green screen issue. Well, you know, deal He's with just, it as you okay. wish. Oh, that's actually a lot in. better. Yeah. <laughs> what a handsome guy. Jeez, wonderful. In. Jeez, what a yeah. great smile. So anyways, on to Cletus Mack, CEO, Cannabis Venture Partners. Cletus, please take it away. How you doing? I'm I'm in Vegas. I just had to check out of my room, move into the next spot, but I'm here. Sorry for the background, guys. No worries. Good to see you. Okay, great. If you wanted to add anything else, Cletus, if not, you can do it later. We'll give you time. No worries. So now let's go to the presenting companies and let's start with our first presentation. And presenting company number one, Car Claudia Post. Founder and CEO, Scarlet Express. You have 12 minutes. I suggest you take six minutes for your presentation, six okay. minutes for Q&A. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Claudia Post. And um, I am really excited to be here because I'm gonna be speaking about two of my passions. One is, of course, cannabis. The other is transportation. I owned a very large transportation company I had 12 warehouses up and down the East Coast. Uh, I had about 1,500 to 2,000 drivers at one time. And so I think that gives me the gravitas to talk about transportation, logistics, supply chain, chain of custody. Some of my clients were marquee clients like University of Pennsylvania, Duke University. So we moved anything within those systems, whether it's medical, and actually we moved organs. So if you, God forbid, were on an operating table, I would have been able to deliver your heart. Um, so my background is wide and deep. I served on every national board of um, trade associations. So I have many, many nationwide contacts. And then I morphed into cannabis. I opened up a company called Most Consulting Group, which is located here in Philadelphia. Our niche uh, practice is cannabis companies nationally and internationally. So two loves, cannabis and transportation. And one day I was sitting at my desk and I said, duh, slap them together, girl, and create a delivery service. Now, I understand how one cannot just pick up and drive from Philadelphia to LA. That's not going to happen. I understand all the background. We do work for dispensaries. So I'm aware of all the rules, all the regs, all the things that we have to do. So if you combine all of that knowledge, Scarlet Express is a real winner. And the reason is I understand the logistics. I understand the insurance. I understand and have contacts, as I say, all over the country. So if I were dealing with a large MSO and they said, I have 32 locations, no problem. I'm there. I have to pick up a phone and I believe in the McDonald's approach. So whatever we're doing in Philly, we're going to do in Chicago. We're going to do in Dallas and we're going to do in LA. I get the business on both ends. The other piece on the other leg of my stool, of course, is the fact that I own a marketing agency. I'm not going to have to go out and say, oh my God, I need a website. I need a brochure. I need how to figure out how to go to market. We do mark, go to market strategy. We do brand strategy. So if you want to see my other company, it's mostconsultinggroup.com. So now on with our, let me get to my next slide. I hate when I'm not supposed to be doing this. Okay, keep going. Okay, here we are. So first off, I'm not going to start to tell you about uh, the industry. I don't have to tell you $130 million and all that other stuff. I want to bring you up to speed about what I understand about the industry, which is, of course, a discreet, secure, and compliant delivery. And that is the most important thing. One of the things that drove me to be able to pick up from the dispensary, deliver to the patient, is compassionate care. And next, as we go and we morph into uh, states that are recreational, which is wonderful, um, we're going to be able to do various other things. We're going to be picking up 
at um, a store, dispensary store. And I use the example of uh, Governor Paul Murphy and New Jersey, who's not going to buy his ounce of bud and he's not going to go stand in the line. The store is going to call us and we're going to deliver. So we have two revenue streams here where possible. The other thing is, is that I have a deep, deep, deep understanding of air, ocean and ground. I can bring in freight from anywhere on the globe. And that's a whole other slice of me. And people say, gee, I didn't realize when we started with the marketing company that we're going to get a transportation expert. But there you have it. That's who I am. Let's talk a little bit about my team. Um, the team has a combined uh, I guess, you know, somebody said, you know, dog years, um, 12 years in the industry. Uh, all of the people that are on my team are professionals. They understand delivery. And then, of course, we have John Monk. We have a next, uh, the next group of folks are our advisors. We have Lynette, who's marketing and communications and been in government for a very long time. Joe Henderson, Trisha Muller is also a political person. She knows where to go. She's in New Jersey. She's, and then of course, my last person is my very good friend, Ken Wolf, who is a security expert. So in terms of all of the things that we need to be successful, I have covered what I believe are all the bases. Now, the problem. Dispensaries don't deliver. I, I say that because running a delivery service is a completely separate industry. It's delivery is not just pick up and deliver. There are so many other things that go along with it. Our technology will allow for absolutely, I'm gonna say this so I, I, I'm gonna do, I don't wanna do transportation speak. You'll be able to input your desired delivery if you're an existing patient, all of your patient information will be stored there. Hey, I do, you know, $200, I buy, out, I buy an ounce, I buy this, whatever, it's all there. And you can replicate that uh, over and over again. It really cuts down on uh, the industry. Uh, the, 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 in the, I'm so sorry. It, 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 it cuts down on the intrusion for the customer or the patient. So I don't need to tell you it's a $130 billion industry. So we're going to move on from that. This deck was created for other folks. Now I will be able to accomplish, as I said, a nationwide door to door delivery. Why? Because I can scale this because I was on every transportation board in the country because I have a very well-known and a uh, reputation in the industry. So I can pick up, as I said, I can pick up the phone and call anybody in terms of the discretion, the security and everything else. We're there, okay? We know what we're doing. So next, this is the life cycle. Six minutes left, by the way. Okay. Uh, oh gosh, okay, let me hurry up. This is the life cycle of the delivery. I spoke about it, let's go, next slide. Okay, this is the, <laughs> this is the, Landscape, we all know it. I don't have to spend my time here. Okay, now we have the logistics knowledge. We have the technology. We have the branding and the marketing and we have the sales. We are cannabis industry experts and we know how to deliver controlled substances. Okay, we're time critical door to door, secure track and trace. And we absolutely have a great idea of what it will take to actually execute on all these. I'm very proud to say and very excited. Um, I, this is my dream. And that's not kidding. When I when this came to me, I said, I really want to do this because I know it. It's like I know the back of my hand. I know deliveries. I mean, not a lot of other gals get excited when they see a tractor trailer on a highway, but I do. <laughs> or they have a warehouse. So anyway, that's us. Um, and I guess it's time for questions. Where are they? Hey, judges, you have a question? Anybody want to lead off? Okay, Carol, we'll start with you. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, great presentation. Thank I you. missed uh, the financial information. Can you please uh, tell me if no, you have a historical sales Yes, I have a financial slide. Income? Absolutely. Okay. Let, me get, and, let me pull that up. Okay, and what there it is. There you go. Instrument? Uh, 
I'm going to answer your question right there. This is, I took a snapshot of the state of Pennsylvania. And all of this obviously has been researched. If you look at, so right now today, and of course it changes on a daily basis, 482,000 patients. I said 20% will want a delivery. You know, don't hold me to that. Hopefully it's a, a lot more. And then we have two deliveries per month. That is the average delivery per month after a lot of research. We will be charging $20 per order. Now, if you see what we're doing here at the bottom of the screen and the explanation, this is pre-tax, this is profit, you know, obviously pre-tax. And um, it takes into account, well, I have the financials, I've got the spreadsheets. If you want to see them, I'd be happy to send Great, them over Claudia. to you. Uh, so are you, are you offering a convertible note? What is the interest, the discount? And what is the minimum investment? Did you ask about a convertible note? Is that what you said? I'm so sorry. My uh -huh. computer's yes. acting up. Yes. I'm sorry. Convertible Three note? Yes. Okay. Oh, gosh. Convertible okay. note. Really uh, quick. Interest rate. Yeah. Discount and the minimum investment. Yeah. Well, okay. So what I say to every investor, and so far I've raised about $175,000, you know, friends and family seed round. Um, I say to them, what kind of investment model are you used to? And I will absolutely entertain um, that person's desire. So um, I would be happy to talk to you about this afterwards. And like I say, I've got all the financials. So if there's another question, I'm so sorry, I ran over. Uh, David so Wise, excited. did you have a question? Uh, yes, a couple of them actually. Um, for, I didn't get to see the financials, so I don't, I don't know if I can take a look at those real quick. I'll have a question on that. Um, so your experience in, you're looking to be a delivery service. Is that what you are looking to do? Yes, I will be a transportation provider from the dispensary to the patient or from the store, if you will, to- In what um, states? Any state you want me to be in, which is what I said. Because okay, so what, do you, been, what do you do? What do you do with states like California, where most every dispensary does deliveries? Well, there are lots and lots and lots of delivery services in California. There are, and lots of them are failing. Well, then I'll buy them. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> then I'll roll them up. I've done. A, I did a roll up before. I can do a roll up again. Okay, David for, Cram, you want to squeeze a quick one in? Yeah, let me squeeze a quick one in. Um, my problem with delivery, and this is not just cannabis delivery, this is any on-demand delivery, is with unit economics and the lack of scalability. If you're a driver and you can only make a maximum of three deliveries per hour, hypothetically, no. tell me how that scales. Okay, here we go. I've got an answer for you too. <laughs> um, Great. All right. I'm so looking forward to it. The model, the model is, is that we will deliver a five-mile radius from the dispensary, okay? Five to six, depends. An average driver wants to make between 150, I'm giving you broad strokes here, between 150 and 200. Uh, 30 more seconds, Claudia, sorry. Am I done? No. 30, yeah, 30 seconds. Uh -oh. Does that help? David, you know, I'm certainly, yes, I have the answer for that. The, I know what the drivers need to make. Remember, I had maybe at one time 2,000 drivers. And I would love to talk to you offline about that. Help me better understand. I like the delivery business. However, I can never wrap my head around the economics. I'll be happy to help. Thank you so much. All right. I guess that's me. It's a wrap. Thank wonderful, you, everybody. Wonderful. Okay, Thank that's you. great. Thank so, you. So time to move on to presenting company number two. And it's Elad Barak, co-founder and CEO Voyager. Uh, Elad, please take it away. Elad, by the way, is no stranger to Cannabis Investing Forum. Good to see you back. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me and really interesting conversation so far. One second. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me again. And we have a lot of uh, interesting updates to share. So I'm just going to dive into it and uh, then go to the Q&A. So, we always like to start before uh, we talk about Voyagers, just to talk about the industry quickly and mention, some, mention one thing that all of us tend to kind of uh, forget. And that is the fact that when we look at the numbers of how many people actually consume cannabis, 
the majority of the population still doesn't consume cannabis. And when we want to go and look at the reasons why, uh, the main five reasons that come up are all around two kind of topics or issues. One is the control and dosing issue that people don't want to overdose. And two is people don't want to smoke and vape. And the Voyager solution answers both of those things. So our, our solution is a pocket-sized dispenser uh, for cannabis uh, or any other liquid that form. But in cannabis, we have two products that we can work with. One is oil drops. Those are the same regular oils that you put sublingually and we are all familiar with and beverage drops. And those are the drops that you can add to a beverage mix and get a cannabis beverage. And the way it works is very easy. You take our dispenser, this is a one-time purchase. You connect the pot to it. You dial in your dose, there's a small screen so you can choose how many milligrams you want. You press the button and you get an accurate dose uh, to your beverage or again, a bling -bling if you want. It's simple, precise, portable and gives you all the control you want as a cannabis consumer. Uh, this is all based on our patented um, we're patent pending on our patent pending technology, and we've just received about a month and a half ago our first uh, review from the PCT. That's the international filing. Um, fairly well, really small comments. We already replied to it and updated also the American submission. So things are going really good from that perspective. Um, we also conducted a market research to kind of better understand if what we're doing really answers the challenges that consumers have. And we were very pleased to find out that when we presented this concept to uh, different consumers and we did a big market research with insights, they, they saw that it's precise, simple, and portable. But above all, they gave our product value. And this is not related to the cost of the product, but actually to the fact that it answers the, the things they need. The other interesting part was the intent to purchase was very high amongst uh, current users. And the more, if you kind of divide the more the, uh, into smaller groups, the higher the consumption rate, the higher the interest to purchase this. And this is completely in line with other concepts that consumers are familiar with. Um, so really good, great results. Now, the way our business works is we sell these pods empty to different cannabis companies. They fill it with their cannabis, they put their own brand in it, uh, and they sell through their distribution channels. And what we kept here in the financials is just to show that our pod cost goes into their COGS, uh, which still keeps them on a 60% uh, gross margin, which is what most uh, cannabis companies aim for. And, and with that in mind, I, I want to take you to our financial projections. And this is looking on our first market that has 35 million uh, population. And within three years, we can reach $35 million revenue. Uh, this is using the assumption that we'll have six recreational partners with us selling those pods and we make again from that uh, COGS, that's where we divide our revenue from. Now the interesting part about Voyager is our scalability, because even if you want to argue our numbers up or down a, a bit, the scalability is what matters here. The fact that we do not touch the plant means there's no border, so we can go to Canada, to the States, to Europe, or any other country we want. The fact that we're doing hardware means the higher the quantity, the lower the cost. This is not a plant or something else. In each local market, we work with local uh, partners, kind of like a franchise or franchisee to manage that local ecosystem. We have a very low setup cost for uh, different partners that want to work with us. We essentially developed our product to be fillable by the same machines that fill vape machines, just because most companies will have that already. And if not, it's a $50,000 device. And last but not least, we like work with local brands uh, to have quick organic growth. Now we're here raising a million and a half US dollars at a 6 million pre-money valuation. And we have two main goals with our raise. The first is to finalize our manufacturing capabilities so we can go to market and we expect to do that in half a year after we fundraise. And the second one is launch in the lead market. Now, once we finish fundraising, we can continue kind of rolling the, the capital and increasing our expansion within the markets. Just quickly from a milestone perspective, so we've passed Health Canada approval last year. We can start selling this product in Canada if we want. We've signed, uh, this is not updated, we have now a few partners that we've signed here in Canada uh, to work together. We're working towards a sensory testing with one of the licensed producers. So they're gonna test it with an expert panel and we're getting ready for full-scale manufacturing and being on the market um, later this year, early 2022. And last thing I wanna mention before we kind of sum this up is 
when we did our market research, we also asked consumers, where else do you see this used? And we were very happy to see that they all went to uh, very interesting fields such as vitamins, medication, caffeine, caffeine drops, essential oils. And what's important to mention here is that we're starting in the cannabis industry, but again, we're a hardware company and our technology can apply also in health and wellness and pharmaceuticals and psychedelics. So we definitely see this going to other places. Uh, so with that, I'll leave it for questions. Thanks. What a pro, good work. So who would like to start? Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, Dr. John Thompson, you have the floor. John, you're on mute. Unmute, there we go, can you hear me now? That's good. Okay, good. Um, hey, good presentation, I really enjoyed it, uh, appreciate that. Um, so can I ask you, what is your, are you gonna wholesale these to uh, the various uh, companies and, and what's that purchase price? I didn't see it, it was at $5? Yeah, so, so the idea is that instead of trying to have our own brand and once we prove yeah. that this delivery method is successful, have people trying to compete with us, we want to just own the platform. So okay. we want to work with the other brands. Um, for the cost of the pot itself for the companies, it varies depending on the milligrams they, uh, they want to put inside. And we have a way to kind of control and monitor that. So they can't just you know, say they want to put 100 milligrams and then put 1,000. But we vary the price according to that. And we've been through the process with a few licensed producers here in Canada, and they're all good with the price. What are your gross margins? Our gross margins are around 60% as well. And have you sold any of these yet? No, so we're pre-revenue. Uh, we have a few uh, deals lined up, as I mentioned, for once we, we have the product. Um, right now, we need to finalize our manufacturing capabilities. So we still need to finish the molding. Why not just use a tincture uh, to dose? Why not just use a tincture dropper? Yeah, sure. So, you know, that, that question comes sometimes. Uh, so here in Canada, I would mention that it's out of regulations. You can't have any more of those uh, droppers or syringes. You can actually only have what's called a dosing cap. Uh, but regardless of that, we see a lot of uh, abilities to do other stuff for product. And it's kind of like a lot of people will use a vape pen and not a regular vape, not only because now you're not smoking, also the convenience that is missing with just dealing with dirty stuff like dry leaf or oil. Uh, but we divided the cannabis that's digestible to kind of three product lines. There's oils, soft gels, and edibles. And you can see that only Voyager allows you to one, really customize your dose because you can't really do that with a dropper, not to the level that we allow you. And then not even the level of accuracy. So we have less than 3% error meaning that if you want to consume three milligrams, you'll get exactly three milligrams. There's no chance you'll take five accidentally and not understand why your experience is wrong. So does the $5 include the pod and the, uh, and the dosage unit or is it, or are those separate? So, so again, we're saying, yeah, that, the, that $5 is all of their cost. Our pod is inside that. That includes their oil and everything they need. Uh, the dispenser itself will be 20 dollars to the consumers and we're not planning on making any profit from the dispenser. So the dispenser is a one-time purchase. It has all the electronics, the battery, the power, um, you know, all the smarts that needs to be done. And the pot is essentially a very sophisticated bottle with a dispensing mechanism that we developed. Okay. Moving on to the next question, um, David Cram. Yes. Hey, um, Great presentation. Really quick question for me. This is in terms of competitive analysis. Who are your competitors in this space as you see them and how do you believe you are different and or better? Yeah, so, so it's very interesting. I think for us, the competition is either digestible products. There's nobody else that we know that does any dispensing mechanisms. Um, so essentially, it's those three groups, right? Now, we believe that, for example, in the beverage side, a lot of companies went with this approach of let's do ready to drink, but nobody thought maybe that's not the right approach. You know, a lot of people will buy coffee, but nobody will buy it in a can. They will buy it in grains, right, and beans. And the same goes to cannabis. Maybe you just need to dispense it to yourself. It's cheaper, it's more convenient, and it's actually to your wanting. So we're competing with them. We're competing with people that want to have capsules or tablets, but don't want to get exactly five milligrams. They want to be able to say, now I need three milligrams, and tomorrow I need to take seven. 
um, and we're competing with the oil. So we're kind of going to, to have to build the equipment and consumers for all of them. Do you view Pax Labs as a direct competitor to what you're trying to do? I view them as or one of our bigger options for an exit. <laughs> Love it. Okay, okay. Carol, <laughs> you got but, one but more question. They do Carol? vaping. things. Sorry, sorry if I can just finish that. Sorry, but they sure, do go ahead. No problem. Right, Carol, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say we they do vaping. Okay, so, uh, we do that. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, do you guys have any any patent uh, issue or in process? Any student exit strategy and the terms, please. Of that. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. What is your exit strategy? What are the terms? And if you have any patent in process. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with the easy one. That's the patent. We submitted our patent in the States. Um, it's actually dated back to July, 2019. Uh, we're patent pending at the moment. We also submitted a PCT, an international patent. We've received the first review. It was really good. We answered a bit and we've also replied also to the US uh, patent office to kind of give them those updates. Our patent is already published on Google if you want to search it without those small updates. Uh, but altogether, I would say it's going really well and, and I believe it will help us protect our product mainly so when we are going to the medical field. Uh, from an exit perspective, right now we're a private company. As I mentioned, I think there will be a few exits within the cannabis industry, either with the big cannabis companies here in Canada or the MSOs, but also potential companies, I think, like PAX that understand this business and know what it means to, to own an ecosystem. And where were PAX was when they started. Nobody's doing this. We're the first one building this ecosystem. And even if you have a few other ecosystems eventually like this, the first mover advantage is very important in an ecosystem where you can kind of block competition. Okay. Elad, sorry, we have to wrap it up. That was a great presentation, by the way. Thank Speaking you. Only for myself. Um, Presenting company number three, uh, Joe Long, president, Surge Automatic. Thanks, John. Surge Automated. Appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Well, thanks for the introduction. And first, I want to comment. It's been a great group. Some of these presenting companies are really intriguing, and I'm excited. Um, but with that, uh, Surge Automated, we are a company that is delivering digital identity and age verification solutions. Um, our vision, oh, I guess, first of all, I should present my deck, John. Minor details, right? Can you hear me okay? No, we can hear you okay, Joe. If you can find your deck, great. If not, just go ahead. It's, no, it's right here. I just neglected to share. Yeah, no worries. Technical challenges. Okay. So, so as we were talking, our vision is to establish the standard in safety and, and security for all unattended age-restricted product sales. And that's very specific here for the cannabis industry. Now, our business mission is to leverage the various industry trends and the market drivers um, so we can capture a share of the roughly 580 million transactions that are taking place in the marijuana category currently. So I want to take a second to touch on some of these trends and the drivers and, and really the inflection point that it's brought us to. So as we all know, COVID has really accelerated uh, leveraging of e-commerce and specifically in marijuana and age-restricted products somewhat in general. Now, the key here is that age-restricted retailers as it relates to e-commerce are facing some, some significant legal challenges. And that comes from existing case law. So anybody here that's experienced uh, navigating to a website, you see the question, are you 21? That's a self-reported gateway. Um, and case law simply won't support that. In other words, if somebody brings up an issue with a retailer, they will lose. Other issues that we need to really be paying attention to as a result of the expansion in e-commerce, of course, is the, the level and rate of fraud, both identity theft, 
monetary fraud, and of course, then we have the age violation components. So as I mentioned earlier, we have safety and security in setting that standards. And what we're doing to help support both the retailers as well as the ecosystem that supports them, e-commerce providers, logistics and delivery, things of that nature, is taking away the overhead or the burden of what I like to call the alphabet soup of, of regulations. So once age-restricted products have gone into e-commerce, they're now subject to series of regulations that are well outside of the industry in addition to the industry. Um, and we can touch on the alphabet soup whenever you'd like to get into more detail. Now we've also gone further and made it very, very easy for them to install our solution set in any aspect of the digital workflow. So you can establish that security gateway at the point of entry or at the point of transaction. And of course, closing the chain of custody at the point of delivery. Now the underlying magic and how we're helping to protect the consumer is by using layered security, okay? So what we're doing is we're preventing and obfuscating any potential use of personally identifying information, okay? And we're using a tool, two key system. In essence, we're identifying and validating the individual against their government ID, confirming that person matches, okay? And then from there, it's a very simple methodology to verify in a digital workflow, this person is who they say they are, and they're of legal age. We also do not share any information. We don't aggregate information to sell downstream. This is truly meant to be a vault, i.e. the name Surge Vault, like security product that individuals can use for this purpose. Now, getting into the business model, uh, we are recurring revenue and we are a software as a service provider. We will be charging a monthly subscription fee and then a per transaction or a verification will range from 50 cents to a dollar. Now that variability comes from the fact that we are a volume-based business. We will be driving the reduced cost to current and new clients as that volume increases while simultaneously increasing our spread or our margin. So we'll, we'll be sharing a portion of that cost reduction. The balance of our revenue will be coming from ancillary elements such as lease revenue from vending units, uh, intelligent locker units, as well as consulting and professional services. Now, our go-to-market roadmap, we've, actually, we've delivered exceptionally well. Uh, about two years ago, we started the journey of sitting down with the Marijuana Enforcement Division here in Colorado, uh, demonstrated our proof of concept, and they completely bought into the efficacy. Uh, subsequently, our solution set and the capacity or capability has been embedded into the Colorado regulations. Uh, product development is progressing exceptionally well, and we've actually advanced and today we're accepted to the National Association of Cannabis Businesses um, and moving forward our standard for the use of this technology. We're about, we've got three clients that we're actively engaged in as part of our pilot initiative, and we're now moving forward with conversations around some of these ecosystem providers like e-commerce, POS, and things of that nature. Now our competition, this is not a new industry. It has been in general com commercial use for mm, 11 years or so since about 2010. I heard some of the folks here have got some background in financial services or FinTech, um, which was my background. So this may sound somewhat familiar to you. GB, uh, GBG, FraudNet, some of these larger global providers have built their technology just like they did in 2010. It's event driven, meaning you do it once you walk away, you never have to deal with it again. And that's probably good because the older systems are a little burdensome. We've turned that on its head. We're using the same depth of Joe, know your- six minutes. Thank you. We use the same depth of know your customer that the financial institutions use, but we then convert that into a transactional model. Our leadership team briefly, well over 100 years, believe it or not, of experience across fintech, production, consumer products, technology, and marketing and development. Into the numbers, uh, we talked about 580 million available transactions. We've taken a very conservative approach. We're looking at a roughly, assuming a 2% penetration rate within three years will be well over $11 million. And you can see that uh, scalability and revenue top line is nothing but upside. I wanna to touch that cannabis only represents 580 million transactions, age-restricted products 
exceed 3 billion in North America on an annual basis. Everybody has access to the deck, so I'll let you go through those details that, uh, that support our roadmap. Our ask is $1 million broken into trenches based on our business model, or our, I should say our business roadmap. Uh, we can certainly have more conversations about those details uh, offline. Our exit is based on acquisition. The industry has grown over the last 11 years by acquisition in vertical market. We are relying on that, and that trend is still continuing forward. And with that, thanks very much for your time. Looking forward to your questions. Okay. Questions? There are hands up, John. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Hands are up, John. Ted, Zach. Okay, Ted, uh, if you want to go forward, then we'll take Zach. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, nice presentation. Uh, two quick questions sort of related to the technology and the rollout. So first of all, um, do you have fully operational software right now that is being deployed in, uh, in various sites or, or is it just, um, you know, demoware or uh, alpha beta? What, how would you characterize the software? Sure. The, you could literally look to virtually any identity verification software. If you've ever opened a bank account online, there's a process that you have to go through. Um, that is the same underlying technology we're taking and adding a layer on top that creates an account centric methodology. And that's what enables the, uh, the transactional component. Okay, great. And then related to that, um, tell me your value proposition relative to sort of the really old school way of just like actually flashing your ID on camera and logging it in the you know, spreadsheet or something like that. Why, why will people pay for this additional service? No, absolutely. And it's, a, it, it's interesting, my fintech background, that was a methodology that has been used um, and is still supported from a regulatory standpoint. However, imagine the consumer experience when you go in, you want to order a product to either go pick it up or to have it delivered. Um, do you want to engage in a web session? Do you want to have a conversation? And how you doing? Most people don't. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Zach? Okay. Uh, yes. So how much money has been spent on the, uh, on the software so far? And then also what is my return on a million dollars and how is the million dollars going to be spent moving forward? Great question. So friends and family, as well as individual founders and co-founders will have to look at our recent taxes, but I think we're about a quarter million in about a hundred thousand in cash. Uh, the million dollar investment over three years, uh, we're anticipating at least a 5X, quite likely getting closer to a 10X return. And the 10X would be closer to the five year. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, if I'm not missing any judges, I guess we could call that a wrap. Uh, good presentation. Um, Great. Thanks. Let's uh, let's now move on. Oh, by the way, pro tip. I should have said this earlier, but I'll just repeat this. Pro tip. Um, I strongly suggest that you have somebody monitor the chats when people are asking questions. So it's just a, it's just a good idea to have something like that. So let's move on to presenting company numero cuatro, number four, uh, Marcel Gamma, CEO, CBD of Denver. Thank you very much, Sean and team. Uh, great pleasure to join in here, uh, be here tonight. Uh, first of all, thanks to Brad and his team making this possible. I would like to present you tonight uh, CBD of Denver, first giving you a short overview about the company. I will do with this with a short video we have made uh, about uh, what we have done so far, who we are and uh, what we're expecting to do. Then a little bit talking about uh, our USP uh, with our Swiss investment arm called uh, Swiss, in Swiss Industry Ventures, uh, making CBD of Denver able to doing investment in Swiss CBD and uh, cannabis com companies. Uh, giving you a short overview about our achievements. Uh, let's then afterwards talk about the market potential and, and how we want to participate on that. And uh, finally wrap up short outlook what we plan to do in the future near future and uh, middle uh, middle future and uh, open then for your questions so let's jump 
Okay, so who would like to lead off? I'm just looking at the hands here. And oh, sorry, I. <laughs> no, it's okay, Marcel. By the way, how what's the, what's the weather like in Switzerland? I have to ask you later on. Yeah, it's quite cold. <laughs> I'm in Panama, and the only ice I want to see is in my drinks, my friend. Nothing personal. John, he's okay. Ready. <laughs> so, who would like no, to? Lead I hope off? you can see my screen now. Uh, no, not yet, Marcel. Oh, I don't. I don't see it actually. Sorry. There you go. You've got it. Shared. There we go. Okay. Then let's start first with the movie and give you, you a short overview about our company. Okay, great. In 2017, in Switzerland and most European countries, CBD officially got legalized by the government. In the following years, the market increased up to 10 billion euros as of today. It is expected that the market will increase year over year up to 18 billion by 2025. My name is Marcel Gamma and I am the CEO and Chairman of Swiss Industry Ventures. We are a Swiss investment company building and developing private equity investment platforms and we currently are developing one in the area of CBD business named Rockflower Group. The Swiss CBD market currently offers great opportunities to buy existing profitable but undervalued business at a very attractive price. We integrate these companies in our existing setup and develop them extensively by expanding customer base and sales and bringing them into new markets. Additionally, these acquisitions follow the guideline to develop the whole value chain, from seeds to customer, for the CBD business in Switzerland and Europe. We have a very professional and diverse team of experts from different areas. CBD business, finance, operations and sales. Our highly motivated and engaged team is key to become one of the top players in the CBD business in Switzerland and Europe. My name is Pascal and I'm the Managing Director of Sales of Rockflowers Group and Board Member of Swiss Industry. My name is Maxim, and of the production here at Rockflower. I'm in charge of the quality for our flowers. The most common is the Harlequin, for example. Um, I have a nugget in my hand. You see the crystals, the smell is amazing. In the blooming stage, we treat our plants with natural nutrition and the best light condition. To not hurt the plants and achieve the best flavors and quality, we only harvest our buds by hand. Rockflower Group has become one of the leading group of companies in the Swiss CBD market. We were able to increase our revenues in 2020 from Q3 to Q4 by more than 40%. That's about $8.5 million. We expect to continue on this level and have budgeted a revenue of $22 million for 21 and are very optimistic to achieve revenues. The Swiss and European market is still in its infancy stage and about 10 to 15 years behind the North American market. Given the roadmap, we will not make the same mistakes again. The Swiss market is expected to increase exponentially in the coming years. We expect a continuous year-over-year -year growth of 20 to 25% in the coming years. So you find us on the internet and you find us also on Instagram. So this was just to give you, let's say, a uh, first impression about uh, our uh, company and uh, what we're doing with our uh, investments in Switzerland. Uh, with Swiss Industry Ventures uh, offers our CBD of Denver company in the US the great opportunity to invest in uh, the Swiss CBD market, companies in the Swiss and European CBD market, and also, let's say, develop a very interesting business uh, in, in this area. As already mentioned, really, we are, let's say, covering the whole value chain. Uh, we are, let's say, we have companies in the area of production. We going through wholesale. We have uh, companies in the area of uh, retail and B2B, and also in the area of the technology and services. Uh, we really, let's say, follow the guideline from seed to customer. Looking a little bit about the competitive advantage offered by the Swiss market. Let's say uh, Swiss market is a, a very interesting market. Switzerland, it's well known for its high quality. Uh, let's say uh, we are in the middle, in the heart of Europe. 
uh, able to deliver uh, CBD, uh, the only company in, 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 by the way, in Europe to delivering, uh, able to delivering CBD, C uh, uh, able to grow, produce and sell product, CBD products all over the uh, European market. We are the only company uh, or the only country in, in Europe uh, which is allowed to grow cannabis up to 1% THC level, which gives us the growth, a great opportunity having high, pro, let's say, high quality products. We are able to wash down and then uh, export to the rest of the Euro European market. We also, let's say, following the Swiss quality standards, and uh, we have very excellent uh, legal setup in Switzerland, uh, giving us a, a uh, yeah, we are already years ahead uh, compared to other countries in, in, in Europe from, from this perspective. Looking a little bit on the achievements we already have done uh, with our uh, investment arm in, in Switzerland, we uh, already have done five acquisitions. Marcel, you have six minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, five acquisitions already successfully implemented. We have an import license for Switzerland. Uh, the uh, expansion to the European market is uh, well on the way. Uh, we have uh, exclusive partnerships with uh, players, Switzerland, Europe, and globally. Uh, also, our product portfolio is covering retail and wholesale. And looking at what we have achieved in, in 2020, we were able to uh, generate the revenue over 16 million Swiss US dollars. With a, a let's say profit margin, net profit margin, a net profit of more than 700, uh, 700,000 uh, Swiss uh, US, US dollars. Uh, already in, in uh, first two months of uh, 2021, we achieved the revenue of uh, 4.5 uh, million Swiss uh, US dollars. Looking a little bit on the market, uh, yeah, the, according to uh, the British Office of, Pro of Pro 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 Prohibition Partners, the, they expect the, the potential of the Swiss market by 2028 uh, up to 2.7 billion, where is about 1.3 billion in the medical sector and uh, 1.4 billion in the recreational use. Uh, talking a little bit about our growth strategy, uh, we are very strong in building brands. Uh, as you have seen, Rockflower is our main brand. We are focusing on and uh, we are, let's say, positioning all our companies uh, in, under this brand. No, short words about uh, uh, the investment opportunity we're offering to our, uh, let's say, investors and companies, uh, uh, let's say, investors in, in, interested in investing in our company. Le looking on the Swiss market, uh, the Swiss market is 10, 10 to 15 years behind the US and Canadian market, but through our, let's say, bridge and uh, uh, excellent connections to the US market, we can uh, use the, the know-how, the knowledge uh, there to really, let's say, be ahead uh, according to other companies uh, in, in our area. Uh, we have already two additional large projects uh, in an advanced planning stage and uh, looking on the multiples possible in this area as per Haywood Capital, uh, it's about 12.4 12 times the enterprise value uh, uh, we uh, can, can buy these companies here in Switzerland. So this was just a little bit about uh, our, yeah, our setup we have here and now opening for open for questions from your side. We have uh, three minutes left, and I just want to say, Marcel, that was an outstanding video. I'm really impressed. And as far as I'm concerned, Swiss chocolate will never be the same. So <laughs> leading on, uh, I had Dr. John Thompson, I believe, that wanted to ask a question. And anybody else that wants to put up their hand, go ahead, please. You're on mute. How many uh, retail outlets do you ha uh, service right now? So we have uh, uh, one uh, own uh, outlet and we already have uh, agreements with uh, large uh, retail providers in Switzerland and, and uh, uh, expanding now to Europe. One of the, our partners, they are, let's say, 
they are in the, uh, we call it kiosk. These are, let's say, small uh, shops uh, at uh, train stations. And they have about 550 outlets uh, in, in Switzerland. And we are just under negotiation with another partner, the Spa Group. They are, uh, let's say, in Switzerland, uh, they have by their own about 200 to 300 uh, outlets. And uh, they are, let's say, strongly, uh, heavily expanding all over Europe. So how many currently? Uh, 100 or, or 5 or 10 or how, how many have right now? One is our own. We have uh, we own by, own by our own, and we have partnerships with uh, these uh, two hundred to three, uh, two hundred fifty to three hundred from the partner. So you're doing twenty two million out of one store. I, I guess I'm not I'm not picking it up. I don't know where, how how you're making the money then. Sorry, you know, John. John, sorry, but I'm going to give ask you to yield to Ted. Give a couple of other people sure. a chance, but. Certainly take those questions offline and, and Marcel, I encourage you to connect, please. So Ted? Yeah. Yep, thank you. Um, uh, very nice presentation and wow, that's such a great opportunity. Uh, the yeah. question I have is, could you please clarify the, um, the, what the investment vehicle is? I see CBD of Denver and Swiss Industry Ventures. Are we, are we investing directly in a foreign company if we do this or through a US entity or what? what is, can you just talk very quickly about sort of what the structure is? As the, the structure is as follows. Uh, CBD of Denver is uh, uh, the publicly traded company in, uh, in the US and you're doing an investment in the CBD of Denver uh, and as uh, Swiss Industry Ventures is, is our investment arm in Switzerland allowing us to, to buy, uh, let's say Swiss and, and European CBD companies at a very interesting, uh, uh, okay. for a very interesting value because uh, let's say in compared to the US market in Switzerland, we buy uh, one to two times the, the, well, uh, the, the, the value of, of the revenue uh, and, uh, and um, to, to buy a company. So, Did you say uh, CBD of Denver is publicly traded? Is that what, that what I heard you say? It's an OTC market trade. Okay, perfect, perfect, thank you. Okay, okay. we're gonna have to wrap this up. Zach, I, if you wanna ask a quick question, last 30 seconds, Marcel, 30 seconds, and we have to move on. Okay. He's on mute. <laughs> Zach, you're on mute. My apologies. Uh, what is your guys' current square footage of canopy and what type of cultivation are you guys doing? Uh, outdoor, greenhouse, are you guys messing with any high quality indoors at the moment? Yes, uh, uh, our production is focusing on, on high quality indoor here in Switzerland which is, uh, let's say, it's, it's, it's the main focus, but we have uh, partners uh, doing uh, outdoor uh, and greenhouse, but uh, our own production is only indoor. Excellent, thank you. We're gonna wrap it up. Thank you very much, Marcel. And uh, now, and since it's GMT plus one, it's probably time for a good schnapps. Great chat and great having you presenting here. Um, for their next company, presenting company number five, Nate, Nuhas, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, founder and CEO, Fast Flower Farms. Nate, Nihus, take it away, please. You're pretty close. It's Nihus. Everyone Nihus. butchers okay. it. Uh, All right, got it. Thank you. No worries, man. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, everybody. Um, some pretty uh, rock star presentations here. Hard to follow. Um, all right, so we're Fast Flower Farms. We're called Fast Flower Farms. If anyone here understands the economics behind actual cultivation, one of the things you quickly learn is that how fast your genetics flower and still maintain quality uh, matters from a cash flow perspective. Um, we merge science and art to create artisanal cannabis products, not craft. Um, the Michigan cannabis market, which is where we're located, uh, is, is absolutely crushing. We beat projections last year by $150 million. It's a $3 billion market now. We have the highest average basket size in the US. Um, current status, we also have a genetics branch of our company. Genetics are the engine of the cultivation car. Um, we're cash flowing out right now. Uh, state and municipal license approval, $250,000 in income coming in December. We own the underlying real estate and all the assets on it. Uh, deeply experienced team, 
and we've put 800k into it already through friends and family and uh, founding partners and we have 250k closing this month uh this is it was it was land now it's a now it's a facility uh and we will be operational next month it's a three billion dollar opportunity up in the top right you'll see what we have what leaflink did us a big favor um the the actual growth state by state uh 342 percent which is you know 10x over what california did um it's going to continue to grow we have 300 percent growth remaining branding super important uh we're not just cultivation uh we are a brand um, the brand ends up being a lot of your IP, um, along with SOPs, genetics, things like that. Uh, and those are the things that can scale and move state to state. So while we are obviously focused on Michigan, we're going to go pretty deep in Michigan. It's a big market. Uh, the things that scale are brands, genetics, and SOPs. Um, consumer experience innovation is a big deal. Uh, you don't see a lot of fly boxes around here, but we're doing it. Um, then we move into, you know, if somebody tries our products. Uh, one of our four chosen cultivars of a genetic cultivar library of about 500. Um, we flowered for, they fit our agronomic data, our agronomic models, uh, and, and then obviously they're very high quality. Um, and then extracts and concentrates, solventless, we're also an extractor, uh, but solventless uh, specifically. We don't, we don't use solvents in any of our extraction. Um, that's the fastest growing and highest margin uh, kind of carve out of the extracts market. And obviously the extracts market is a very fast growing market. 20 years in the hands-on cultivation experience just between my guys that does include my cultivation experience. Um, I have another five years on that. Uh, exceptional business leadership. This is my third startup, uh, second one that I've owned. Inclusive genetics. Genetics, the genetics we have on hand. We have, we have a library of 500 cultivars on hand right now. Um, we have developed genetics over about 10 years. So my my operations guy was the chief geneticist behind the Emerald Cup product supply company. You guys may have heard of the Emerald Cup, I suspect. Um, and uh, so we develop, he developed these genetics uh, specifically that yield very well in solventless production, uh, which is a big deal. We don't have to scale the brand or we can scale the brand more quickly than we can actually scale the build out of the cultivation facility. Um, it's a lot faster. Uh, the brand is the, the, the brand is, is 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 fast to scale, whereas the cultivation facility itself takes time and a lot of capital to build out. Consumer experience innovation, we've talked about that, and it's almost extraction. Um, anybody who knows anything about cannabis on the on the extraction side knows the powerhouse of solventless is, how important it is, and then how difficult it is. Um, if you don't if you don't have the knowledge, the SOPs, and mo most importantly, the right genetics. Uh, you fall flat on your face. On the other hand, if you know these things, uh, you can absolutely crush it. The margins here are very, very high. Uh, here in Michigan, there's only one of the solventless company. They were just picked up by, by a company called Pincana. Um, so we would effectively be the only other solventless company here in Michigan. This is the team. They say you don't bet on the horse, you bet on the jockey. Um, I'm U.S. Army combat vet. Uh, coming back from combat, I, you know, it, it was a rough tour. Uh, so there was a lot of insomnia. There was a lot of pain. Um, one of the things that definitely helped that was cannabis. Obviously, you can't use it in the military, and that's something I'm, uh, I'm pretty adamant about changing. Mike Angelotti, uh, this, is the, this is one of the, the, a lot of the brains behind the operation. He's been doing solventless extraction for seven years uh, in California under the Emerald Cup product supply company. He's bred all these genetics and he ran a 22,000 square foot facility there for 10 years. Um, Zach Heinitz, he's been, doing, he's been doing cannabis cultivation here in Michigan a little over 10 years. We call him the plant whisperer. And then advisory board are a lot of important people that we take advice from. Proformas, 2021, 1 1.4, 2022 jumps up because we have solvents on the shelves. That's, you got six minutes. Yep. That's the jump is, uh, is the solvents. Advisory round terms. Um, we're raising 1.2. We are 300, uh, we, 250 in and 300 soft circles. Uh, convertible debt, great terms, 35% discount, and a val cap of 10 million. Uh, the val cap and the discount work together, uh, which is also relatively rare. Also, there's a preferential payback um, in that 
no common stock shareholders can receive any cash dividends until uh, principal plus interest is paid back at the point of conversion of the convertible debt. Questions? Questions, anyone? Okay, David Wise, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Nate, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, tell Sumit I said hello. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I'm trying to understand, is it that you're growing genetic specific for solventless extraction and that's where you're looking to expand? We, we've already done all of that homework. It takes many years to get that right. Um, that gives us a significantly higher yield in solventless than anybody else. Um, an average yield in solventless is about 3%. Ours mm -hmm. do anywhere from four and a half to seven. And are you doing that uh, just strictly from the plant? Or are you doing fresh frozen? Are you extracting CO2 fresh by frozen, resin? Fresh frozen, 100%. It's all live rosin. We don't do any distillates. We are uninterested in adulterating the plant. Um, and we just provide the highest quality stuff. I, we, will, we don't sacrifice the quality. And in this market isn't really in existence yet in Michigan, you're saying? At all. Okay. All right, those are my questions. Great. David Cram. Hey, Nate. Uh, also, uh, tell Sumit I say hi as well. Uh, seems like he knows a bunch of us. Um, is the opportunity here on the solvent list or is it on cultivation or both? Like, what's your core competence? Maybe I, maybe I answered that question. And in terms of scalability, tell me how you scale into your revenue projections from a cultivation standpoint. So a throughput of biomass for your extraction. 100%. So, so there's, there's two ways that the revenue really, the, that two things that really move the revenue needle. One of them is, out, is, is effectively becoming a white label solventless uh, producer. Um, and that, that generates a lot of revenue because people just don't know how to do it. Um, the other thing is we have the, the genetics division that sells to licensed uh, horticulturalists uh, in, the, in the Michigan cannabis market here. Uh, and then the third one is indeed cultivation. Now that biomass, we have genetics that perform very well outdoors. Uh, and we can take the outdoor product, which is the lowest value cannabis product, and turn it into solventless, which is the highest value cannabis product. So you have a margin that's absolutely massive. Wouldn't you just focus all of your time and energy on doing just that if that's where the margins are? Yes and no. Um, having, your, having a single source garden is really important for a lot of people and it gives us a lot of place, a lot of space for R&D, a lot of space for collaboration. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing to have that capacity. Now, there's a lot more margin developed, uh, a lot more margin uh, that, that we can continue to develop as we build out. Um, our next phase of production, we're doing indoor, we're indoor right now. Our next phase of actual cultivation is going to be in greenhouses, highly automated greenhouses. Now, so that, so then our margins, so then we don't have to wait on outdoor product. Uh, we can grow something that has a similar cost outdoor, a little bit more, uh, but, but still have those big margins that we control the supply chain, which is the big deal. Awesome. We should connect. We're looking at some stuff in Michigan from a real estate standpoint, specifically indoor cultivation and greenhouse. So let's connect offline. Thank you for your answers. Okay. Dr. John Thompson. John, you might be on mute, man. <laughs> I drive me crazy when I do that. <laughs> Yeah, I was just curious as to how many dispensaries you guys are supplying. And do you have any contracts uh, our, with that uh, since first, you got your building? Yeah, our first rollout is going to be to 10 different dispensaries. Um, we're in conversations about that now. There's a, there's a moderate likelihood that we'll actually be engaged, but we have to see about that. Okay. Um, any more questions? If not, uh, you have 30 seconds to wrap it up, Nate. Any questions, anyone? Uh, no, go ahead, Nate, please. Absolutely. So um, we are $250,000 in. We are uh, 300 soft circled for, for this month. We got a couple of big guys that, that I think are going to come in and take a big bite. Um, we are specifically looking for, we turned away a little bit of capital. We are specifically looking for uh, people who can add real value to this. We're calling it our advisory round for, for a reason. Smart money makes a difference here. 
Um, so if, if anybody here has a connection that would be good for this, I would also very much appreciate that. And that's a wrap. Great, good, good presentation, Nate. Good for you. And your country thanks you for your service. And now they should allow you to take your product freely without restraint. Because after all, cannabis is medicine. And whatever mental health issues may, and, you know, some of us may have, I'm talking about myself, uh, it's, uh, drugs are not drugs. It's a mental health issue. It's not a criminal issue. And it was off my soapbox. Sorry. My wife deals with veterans. So on to the next one. Um, presenting company number six, Noah Sayers, CEO, Bud Buddy. You have the floor, Noah. Hello. Yeah, hi, Everybody Noah. How you doing? doing? I see your I see your computer screen. Yep, there it is. Yep, I'm just trying to get the uh, perfect. Can everyone can everyone see the uh, the pitch deck slide? Yep. Okay, perfect. Oh, my uh, my video is not on. One moment. Take your time. Uh Whoops, what is, perfect. Um, all right, so can everyone see the, the slide now? I see the desktop. Okay, my, my apologies. One moment, let me, perfect. What about now? Got it. All right, great. So first of all, uh, I just wanted to thank you, John, and and David and Brad for, for putting this great event on. Uh, my, my name is, uh, is Noah Sayers. I'm the founder and CEO of Bud Buddy. And Bud Buddy's goal is to make cannabis easy in every sense of the word. Um, we do that first and foremost by making it simple and foolproof for customers to uh, order cannabis products and accessories online. Uh, what sets us apart from our competition is that we deepen our partnerships with dispensaries by providing them with point of sale hardware and software for free. Um, this point of sale software is compliant with whatever state their seed to sale system is in. And this solves a ton of pain points for both the customer and the partner dispensary. For instance, if a customer is ordering on a competitor's online ordering platform right now, that online ordering platform has to work with one of potentially dozens of cannabis specific point of sale systems. This leads to a lot of issues in terms of inventory and product syncing uh, on the actual, on what the customer is actually looking at. So for instance, a product that to the customer appears in stock to the actual dispensary may not be. And this means that the dispensary could lose out on sales and the customer could choose to not order from that dispensary again and have a negative uh, customer experience. Uh, by having a closed loop ecosystem where all the dispensaries on our platform would need to use our point of sale software, we completely solve that problem. It also aligns the incentives between us and the dispensaries correctly because we only make money when they make money. Our business model is that we charge a flat $5 fee per dispensary order. Um, given that the average dispensary in California has about 112 uh, orders a day, that, expand, that creates a significant revenue stream the more dispensaries we onboard. Um, but we don't just stop there. We've noticed that for many of our uh, competitors, the, while they may have cannabis products available for sale, the accessory products are an afterthought. They may have you know, a, a banger or a single brand of white labeled rolling papers available, but if you wanna get a bong or a vaporizer or a grinder or anything that you actually use to consume your cannabis products, you're fresh out of luck. You might as well just you know, go to a smoke shop down the street. And we think it's ridiculous that you can't get everything cannabis related in one place. In our view, it shouldn't be harder to order cannabis products and accessories than it is ordering takeout food. And that's the problem that Bud Buddy solves. Um, what I'd like to do now is briefly take you through a mock-up of the future uh, web portal 
of our platform to give you sort of a better idea, a visual sense of what we're what we're going for. Um, is everyone able to see the the mock-up right now? Um, hello. Not not sure if. Uh, I'm not sure if people are, are hearing this. Um, let me. We can hear you. Okay, okay perfect. I think I think uh, I think I fixed the glitch. Yeah. So I want to take everyone through. So right now, if you look at the the UI of this mockup, you have everything broken up into broad categories. So you have by, by function. So you have smoking, vaping, dabbing, dabbing, accessories, hemp and CBD, cannabis, and within that, you get finer and finer. Uh, product sorting ability. So for instance, within smoking, you see, okay, you select hand pipes within smoking, then you can keep narrowing down the subcategory of hand pipe by type of hand pipe, by color, by length. So for customers, we, we make it easy for customers who know nothing and for customers who are masters of everything cannabis related to find exactly what they're looking for. The other key to our platform that sets us apart is the ability to search by product effect. Um, you know, I like to say that grandma doesn't doesn't care whether it's blue dream or purple crack. She just wants to know what'll fix her glaucoma. So by give, so by giving the ability to, uh, you know, sort by whether something will be energizing or 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 help with sleep or with pain relief, we make cannabis not just easy, but we make cannabis useful. Um, and that is that is really the the gist of it. I think if you if you look at our our overall business model, you know, as of right now, this is a slightly out of date, but there's a you know about 700 or so dispensaries in California. Uh, you do the math, and that's uh, you know, we, if we sign up all 631 dispensaries at the average of 112 orders a day. That's you know 127 million dollars of gross transaction fee revenue, which is enormous. I think also no, you, you got six at... minutes, and if you want to take any questions, perfect. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take questions. Okay, so question time. Who has questions? All right. Um, maybe I'm missing something here. Wave Zach, at me, please. Zach has his hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, so I'm just watching the chat and it was kind of a question that I had as well, but a lot of people are kind of asking, how is this different than weed maps? So weed maps, it, so I, I, I could go on and frankly, an entire rant about, about <laughs> weed maps from the 60% of their reviews that are fake and done by bots to the fact that for the longest time, weed maps was just a glorified inferior version of Yelp. Now, you know, where you could, you know, look at reviews and, and look up products by name, but, you know, an earlier version of our pitch was literally, you know, if the typical experience is going on weed maps, uh, calling up the dispensary, texting them a picture of their ID, and just, you know, 10 steps of, of barrier between buying and receiving. Um, weed maps now is, you know, trying to, to, to put on a better face, uh, first and foremost, with with weed maps, we're not, uh, you know, being sued by states for putting illicit dispensaries up, so we're not a liability to invest in. Um, more, more importantly, I have never seen a customer who has told, who has said to me, "I really loved my experience ordering on weed maps. I felt like I was able to find exactly what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted." That that is what Bud Buddy does. We make it easy. Weed maps doesn't. Perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. I have a question from the audience, actually. Sure. Um, would a dispensary have to change POS, which I believe is point of sale, to use your system? What if they didn't send to switch POS? I guess they're talking so, discussing, trying to understand what the switching barriers would be. Sure. So in, in terms of, so we, we do require that, that dispensaries use our point of sale system because, you know, the biggest issue right now is that if an ordering platform has to use one of a bunch of uh, different POS systems, they have to make sure they work well with each one. 
And that is not only leads to more errors for both the dispensary and the ordering platform, but it also creates more moving parts and issues for the customers, which ultimately hurts the dispensary if those customers you know, don't place an order or have a bad experience as a result. In terms of transitioning, um, our, we do make it very easy for customers to export their existing data and POS software from their old system to their new one. And I'm happy to, to talk to any, speak to any concerns about that with any investors or customers after the, the panel as well. But, but we do feel, to, answer, to directly answer the question, we do feel that uh, having dispensaries use our, our point of sale system and, and in, be within the larger ecosystem is a, is a key part of our platform. Okay, and there's another question from the audience, right? Um, so aren't they now using two point of sale systems if they have still have to use one in their store? No, because they, they basically, so exporting data is a one-time process. So they basically, if, if they signed up with us, uh, they'd be exporting their data from their current POS system and then be able to immediately use ours. So they would no longer be using the initial one once that uh, prior data was exported. Okay, and Peter Casper, did you have a question? No, okay. Did not, fine. apologies. No, it looked like you were waving at me, so that's why I was wondering. Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's summarize then. Uh, if you could tell me in 30 seconds or less, give me your elevator pitch, Noah. 30 seconds sure. or less, tell me why I should consider your opportunity, why we should go out on a date. Ah, absolutely. So the opportunity here is that BudBuddy makes it easier to, to uh, order and receive cannabis products than it is ordering takeout food. We put everything in one place, make it easy to find what you want, find what you're looking to feel and experience based on product effects and get it delivered quickly and easily fast. That's a wrap. Sounds great. Okay, well, thank you, Noah. Thank you for your time. Good to see thank you here. You. Your first time I've seen you here and look forward to seeing you back. So Absolutely. good place. Happy actually. to be here. And uh, I like your style, by the way. I, I apologize if I was laughing. It's, <laughs> I like your, no uh, your thing about your grandmother and the, and the crack. I mean, that's hilarious. You know, I, I got to remember that real. one. No worries. All right. Anyways, let's move on. Presenting company number seven, Oliver Horn, CEO, Elixinal Global. And I just want to say, I have tried your Omega turmeric product. Ah. I think it's awesome. Uh, your rock star, John. Thank you very much. Let me um, let me share my screen. And look, I'm calling you from Australia, Melbourne. Um, so I hope you're all doing well on your side of the world. We're certainly watching what's going on. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, look, just you know, to make most use of the six minutes, um, I'm the CEO of um, Elixinol Global, have been for a year. And it's a publicly listed company in Australia, so it's on the ASX, um, but it's also on the OTC. Um, and yeah, we are basically a CBD and hemp expert. We've been 20 years in, in CBD and, and, and hemp, um, really starting with hemp foods, hemp proteins, um, and various food sources uh, around hemp. Um, but we also have a very extended skincare range um, and also the Elixinol um, CBD range, which you can you know, find in, in the US very widely distributed. Our vision as a business is uh, fairly and squarely to build a, a global hemp derived health and wellness consumer products business. So we've rejuvenated ourselves um, throughout the course of the last year, really focusing on CPG disciplines and creating consumer products and consumer marketing, disvesting ourselves or getting out of um, lower value B2B and, um, and bulk services, for example. What makes us unique um, besides the, I guess, um, you know, besides being 20 years in, in, in hemp really, and being a pioneer, a pioneer in the area is, is our global footprint. So we've really over the last couple of years invested into global markets because the trend around CBD in particular and hemp as well, yeah, is quite remarkable. So. In Americas, we have um, our base in Colorado, around 40 people. Um, we have about global revenues at the moment of 15 uh, million, um, half of that coming really out of the Americas. Um, but really interestingly, over the last two years, we invested ourselves very heavily into Europe um, and have been in there since 2018, had a real first move advantage. It's now around 20% of our group revenues 
Um, but that market is set to explode. We're expecting a 34% CAGR rate on growth and getting to 2.3 billion uh, market opportunity. And we've been there with an early mover advantage. I'm gonna to talk to you in a minute about also an acquisition that we've made there, which is really ex um, exciting to get us even deeper into Europe. And on top of that in Australia, our business, Hemp Foods Australia, uh, which has been operating since 1999, 20 years, um, you know, it's delivering one third of our revenues. Um, on top of that, we have various um, distributors and partners in, in Mexico, South Africa and Japan. We're licensing our brand out. It's just being relaunched. So I guess what you can see, you know, we're one of the very few publicly listed companies that has a truly global footprint with a diversified um, revenue stream, which insulates ourselves um, against risk in certain countries. And certainly we've seen the Americas are challenging at the moment. Uh, but then participating in this great growth that's happening um, all over the world. Um, to give you an insight into our European footprint, just um, taking the UK, UK, by the way, is um, Europe's biggest CBD market at this stage. We are really well distributed. Um, over the last year, we landed um, over 2,000 new distribution points. Superdrug is um, one of the biggest drugstore chains. Um, that we are in well pharmacy, independent pharmacy chains. Alliance Healthcare is a wholesale distributor um, to 20,000 um, healthcare practitioners and pharmacies, boots in Ireland, um, and a number of e-commerce operators as well. Plus, we're supplying to Pharmacare, which is a, a big player. Uh, we're uh, supplying all their, um, their CBD products under co-branded range um, that's powered by Elixinol. So really significant um, foothold into you, um, the UK market, which makes us um, very different. Um, touching very briefly on our financial um, summary. Look, we've, we've been through a reset and I came on um, through the course of last year. I've been in the role now for 11 months to turn the business around. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, um, we were mounting pretty big losses on our EBITDA line. Um, you see that you know, at some half, the previous half, first half 2020, we had 15 million um, EBITDA loss. And really the work that I've been doing with my management team is taking the cost out 45%, pretty much half the cost of the business, um, taking out all the low value items, bulk and private label. You see on the left-hand side, they were a big part of our business. And then most importantly, we um, refinanced uh, ourselves with a heavily oversubscribed um, capital raise, uh, we wanted to raise only 2 million from, um, from shareholders, but um, we were oversubscribed with 27 million of offers. We took in 20, 20 million in, um, in funding and I've now got a, a really strong balance sheet. We had 28 million cash in the bank, no debt. Um, and so what you really see is like a clean, cleaned up uh, financial position, taking cost out of the business um, and reinvested a lot of our time and money into relaunching our Lixinol brand. You know, if you've taken the Omega One, it's a part of our new range. We only launched that um, in March, April, and we launched it around the world. So completely new business, um, consumer-centric, uh, margin and, uh, and brand focused on a lean cost base and in a very stable financial position. So we are really well funded. But what I want to you know, sort of get on your radar today, um, we've just announced to the market this week on Monday, um, that we are, uh, have a proposed acquisition that we're putting to our shareholders in May for vote uh, to acquire Germany's number one um, CBD brand. And you see that in front of you, the company is called Canacare. The brand is Canovo. It's the number one brand in uh, bricks and mortar, four and a half thousand retail distribution points. Um, and their success really has been very early on in creating a strong consumer brand by um, going into broad reach distribution and drug stores, where they're the number one, but then supporting it with national television advertising. And when you Google it, you can see a number of spots that have been running last year. So they really cracked the code to get a startup business going, get it to 3 million euros um, uh, revenue, make it profitable. It's already profitable. Um, and it's now the number one brand in, in Germany. And what we're really excited about when you look at their distribution footprint, uh, with one of our four and a half thousand um, stores that they're, they're servicing, which includes- Oliver, you have six minutes. Thank you very much. I'm fit wrapping up in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see that um, we are really well positioned in the German market. So it's an acquisition for us 
um, which is an upfront consideration of 9 million, maximum 24 million um, euros. Um, but you know, it's going to change the game for us as we are now in the UK, in Germany, um, you know, in really two strategic markets on top of the US, on top of Australia. So I guess what I want to leave you with sort of as a, as a your elevator pitch is think about us as a, um, you know, being positioned in our global markets that are high growth CBD and hemp markets. We've been in the markets for a long time. We're a 20 year long old established player. We have a publicly listed company that is extremely well funded with a strong balance sheet. We have an optimized cost model now. We've taken the cost out. We're focusing on brand building. Um, and we're continuing our global expansion to take you know, part in this exciting trend that we see around the world. And I guess why we're here um, today, we're looking for retail investors and, and uh, sophisticated investors are sitting here in Australia. We don't really get the message enough to America, um, which is actually a home country for us and hence you know, reaching out to you and putting us on the map because it's a different business than Elixinol was just a year ago. Um, so that's it. I guess we take it over to questions, John. Thank you. Okay, that was good. Thank you, Oliver. Um, good pitch. Um, who has questions? I'm looking for the little hands. Anyone? Okay, Ted Bernhard. Go ahead, please. Yep. Thank you. Uh, very impressive presentation, sort of related. Um, uh, you're, you're, are you, am I understanding you correctly that you are raising money to sort of increase your profile in the in the U.S., uh, because it sounds like you have a pretty strong balance sheet and don't really need a lot of. <laughs> yes. With. No, we've we've actually we're actually well well funded. We are not raising money. Yeah. We don't raise money, so there's no dilution moment coming to any shareholder anytime soon. No, it's more about we 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 just retail investors, individual investors, institutional investors, sophisticated investors. They don't know about us in America because we're in Australia. Gotcha. Yeah, and so really, this is about um, you can buy us on the share on the OTC. Um, very, very easily, but we just haven't marketed ourselves. And that's a missed opportunity. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that's great, thank you. And then the second question, um, uh, I, I, that, it was great to see the product mix there. Uh, and you sort of alluded to this, the, the regulatory uh, framework in, in the US for marketing CBD type products is kind of a mess. Do you, do you see that changing? And how do you see the mix of your uh, products between the different geographic regions yeah uh, look, good point i think we are expecting that the fda regulates um you know um, cbd as a dietary supplement yeah and i certainly have that expectation that we see significant yep. movement in the second half so that should really give us a tailwind for the industry uh, which we also necessarily need and better regulation so that's one uh, but Ted, the most exciting thing is that the european union the world health organization the united nation um you know declared cbd not a narcotic and now the European Union has passed um, a binding um, um, judgment from all European countries to, to adhere to that. And now we are positioned in those countries and that gives us a huge opening of those markets. And that's incredible growth for us. That's very exciting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted, for the question. Okay, David Cram. Hey, Oliver, uh, <clears throat> this is David Cram here. Um, great presentation. I've actually been familiar with your company for years. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that, you know, this turnaround is happening. Um, outside of being an M&A acquirer, um, given your upcoming proposed acquisition, what would you say are the other exciting growth levers to this business, maybe more organically than um, inorganic growth via acquisition? Yeah, so I think there's um, a couple of things that um, are really exciting opportunities for us. One is the market entry to Asia and to China in particular. Um, look, Australia is very close to China and we have a lot of trading ties. Um, so it's a very easy platform. I think that is uh, uh, some of the that nobody talks about the Asian market is not really well discovered. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's one. Um, Australia has just changed their regulation to de-scheduled CBD. It's um, you know, from a special access scheme and it's going to become a, available in, in pharmacy and, and that's our home play. So you know, that's a natural opportunity for us. Um, yeah, and then I think there's a, a massive category expansion. I think the time of plain CBD tinctures and oils is gone. Um, you know, the, the market's becoming more sophisticated and we've got a pretty big R&D facility to get come up with better IP. I don't think there's enough IP. And so um, I think that's a part of our investment strategy as well. So there's a number of avenues of growth, economic recovery, regulatory environment, everybody knows that. Uh, but then there's geographies, geographies which we can access, which are you know, huge. 
Awesome. Um, and one and one and one sorry, quick David, forgive me. I have to um, uh, yield to John Thompson. Just a quick question, John. You have less than a minute wrap up, and I suggest to all the panelists. Uh, the, and the judges that you uh, contact Oliver Horn. And I'm sure Oliver, you've got somebody in the chat will help you. A good presentation, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, what, what do you see the path to profitability on your business? Look, we've, um, uh, we don't provide any forecasts, um, John, uh, but there's analysts out there which are covering us, um, you know, and they expect us to be profitable um, towards the tail end of 22, early 23. 23. Yeah. Hey. I, I see that you have thousands of stores that you're in right now. I mean, yeah. is, is the volume, is the velocity in those stores really what's inhibiting the, the top line? Yes. You're spot on, John. Like footfall in retail has been atrocious. Yep. I mean, everybody in the industry can probably attest to that. And unfortunately, right. we- well, Oliver, lost... sorry, I have to call time. Forgive me. No, you're right, John. That's, that's only fair. Thank you. Okay. Now, on to our last presenter, but certainly not our least presenter, uh, Peter Casper, founder and CEO, Terpley, that's T-E-R-P-L-Y. Uh, Peter, please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much. Let me just get everything set up real quick. You guys still see the, see the page? I see it. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, shoot. So, hello everybody. My name is Peter Casper and I am in the problem solving business. We're in an industry here where there are lots of problems that the average business doesn't face but as an industry where every single statistic is telling us that the stats are booming. There's lots of money being made. But there's also lots that's being lost. The federal government isn't in place. There's no right to use banks. You can't cross state lines. All things other businesses have, things that require us to be especially effective and efficient for bringing in new information and driving profit for businesses. Today, I'm happy to debut Terpley. My solution, to some of these inefficiencies. Primarily, the fact that we understand little about how cannabis actually affects us. There's way more attention on the medicinal properties. Terpley is focusing here on the recreational properties. The issue for brands and producers, primarily being the fact that they don't know who their customers are. Because when data stops at the point of sale, how can you understand what, you act, like what your actual consumer likes about the products that you're making? And the consumer can't predict product effects before purchase. Honestly, with the high price point of cannabis goods, this is an extremely frustrating situation because you can't return your products. And consumers deserve to have confidence with their purchases. And you might be asking, oh, but you already have indica, sativa, and hybrid for these labels. But according to a recent survey on LinkedIn conducted by Cody Peterson, a cannabis pharmacist that I'd recommend you follow, only 11% of individuals found these labels for indica and sativa to actually be helpful for determining what their products will do for them. And we continue to interview various users, cannabis enthusiasts, and repeatedly we found that product effects were the primary consideration, both when they were selecting products, as well as the main pain point over their cannabis journey, costs coming in second to that. When it came to the reliability of packaging information for determining these effects, on average, consumers rated it as a two out of five. So we interviewed various brands to understand their process for diagnosing product effects. 86% of them said they relied on subjective experience for determining how to label this product for the rest of the market, which we know is flawed when you know that everybody's affected by cannabis uniquely and everybody knows someone who's tried a product and decided it wasn't for them when in reality, it probably just wasn't the right cannabis product for them. When we interviewed them to understand their feedback process as well, 50% said this process for getting feedback from the consumer was anecdotal at best. The other 50% said it was non-existent or too difficult to pay any mind to. The elegant solution for all this, Terpley, a free mobile app for consumers where they, they can get scientific product insights 
and community reviews to better help them with the product discovery process. You can see on the left side here, our first prototype of our product page, detailing the terpene profile for this particular product. Additionally, users can get localized product suggestions and discounts from our partnered brands, retailers, and point of sale systems. Not to mention our integrative review system means that the more consumer reviews, the better the recommendations get over time. And this is something that they can take across markets as well. On the brand and producer side, you'll be able to get actionable customer and product insights, as well as product forecasting on the chemical analysis through a subscription data dashboard. Not to mention that we'll be offering enhanced ways to engage with our users through our affiliate and ad programs as well. And we're expecting this impact to be massive. Consumers now have support from the scientific and community level Intel. They can get cheaper prices for their cannabis goods and purchase products with confidence. Retailers will be able to elevate their bud tenders to our bud tender platform and be able to help better market products efficiently and improve the overall patient outcome. And on the brand side, they finally get to understand who their target customer and market is so they can design the product that are fit for their target consumers and overall increase their customer loyalty. We believe this market opportunity is massive. With data sourced from MJBD for all the licensing information, we're projecting this to be almost $2 billion when you look at the entire US. It's almost half a billion when you narrow it down just to California. And with just our current capabilities for the Turplay team, we're projecting this to be a $10 million opportunity. The competition is also very fragmented. Currently, we have players like BDSA, Headset, Trees, Leafly, and Weed Maps who are providing out market intelligence, but are really stopping short when it comes to arming consumers with tools to take into a dispensary and look at the product they're holding in their hand. Relief and Lucid Green are the first ones that have consumer-facing applications, but they're either focused on the medicinal properties, they lack the personalization or product recommendations from their previous usage. The way we operate is very simple as well. We analyze wow. lab data from our partnered I brands. I lost access when I open up my... We, <laughs> excuse me, we uh, analyze lab data from our partnered brands, retailers, as well as lab integrators. We provide our product insights down for our consumers, incentivize a review system with discounts and deals, and then generate consumer insights, which we provide back to retailers and brands as our primary form of making money, our data subscription dashboard. They can now understand their customers and markets, evaluate different product trends, and access their very own lab testing data. Additionally, we'll have different streams where they can push product suggestions through a recommendation engine, as well as sponsor affiliate products and brands through our affiliate program. Financially, we're projecting to reach profitability between years two and three, and have additionally laid out our CAC and LTV metrics down there below for you guys to review. The team that's bringing this together is myself, Peter Casper, who has a background in applied mathematics and finance, finishing up my MBA from USC Marshall, and someone who has completely dedicated his career to the cannabis space. From founding and leading the Marshall Cannabis Industry Club, USC Marshall's first graduate level business of cannabis organization, to working at Travic Capital, a cannabis SPAC headed by James Parker, the former CFO of MedMen who took them public, who's now an advisor and one of our lead investors. We've also onboarded a key hires here as well, from a branding and marketing perspective, as well as our front end and back end for product development, on top of a robust senior advisory team, covering executives across the, in, across the industry, from flower hire, MedMen, and acreage holdings as well. Moving forward, we're seeking a half million dollar raise at an $8 million valuation, particularly from preceding angel investors, and seeking out our brand and retail partnerships as well. This industry is rife with problems, but it doesn't have to be. Terpoli is here to drive more efficiency into the marketplace. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. Okay, anyone, questions? Who would like to lead off? Okay, Dr. John Thompson, go ahead, please. Well, sir, uh, great presentation. I, I love software. I, I think it's it's awesome. It's the future. Um, can you go with over again with me what your revenue model is? How, how are you going to, who's going to pay for this service? Absolutely. So primarily it's going to be our brand and retail partners who will be subscribing to our dashboard, as well as utilizing our affiliate and ad programs as well. Um. Have you considered white labeling any of that 
it, would you do a like a brand based uh, app? So specifically, just a brand. Mm -hmm. So we believe that would be kind of leveraging or wedging ourselves too closely into one corner of the market. This has the potential to reach every single market that has a legal cannabis market. You All can we still need aggregate the data, though. You you could still aggregate the data. Uh, I guess uh, I'm cu just curious what your thoughts are on that. A big issue for the consumer base that we've developed so far is access to other branded products. It can be too hard for a consumer, especially with how fragmented the market is and how many brands are on shelves, to only go to one particular product. Judges? Anybody have any questions? If not, I could take one from the audience. Um, this is a comment. This is a complicated and crowded space. How does your data collection relate slash, front slash compete with other data groups like headset.io? 2 billion isn't a lot of TAM. I don't know what that stands for with several competitors. I guess total out mar access market. So Yes. So primarily BDSA, headset, trees, all of those go to the point of sale. They stop at the retail level. So you can understand basket sizes, different consumer preferences for what they're purchasing, but we have no idea how people are actually engaging and interacting with these products, what they're actually recommending, how they're feeling as, as a matter of fact afterwards. Brands need to design products for their consumers, not for the bottom line. Designing it for the consumers first helps the bottom line, but you can't use operational efficiency to drive your impact for consumers. You know, I wish that I was an investor judge because my background is software and I love to ask you questions, but not this time. So Maybe judges, offline. Yeah, offline. Judges, anybody <laughs> have any questions? Okay. Well, I think we can then wrap that up for now, Peter. I, you know, I like your presentation and just talking to you, I can feel my IQ going up. Uh, <laughs> I'm used I to working it. with people a lot smarter than myself and, uh, you know, having spent many years in software, all I can say is that uh, this is interesting. So Thank you. we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you, Peter. And it is now time for voting. Uh, judges will each select one company to give their vote and a pop-up window is now available on your computer where the audience, you, will be able to vote for your favorite company presentations. So I hope you see the, uh, the pop-up. And by the way, I'm not allowed to vote. I can only stare. So there it is. And as a reminder, by the way, to the audience, to everyone, you have access to the presenting companies and investor judges information and contact information at the Cannabis Investing Forum website, www.cannabisinvestingforum.com. Uh, I strongly suggest you check out the website. There's actually some really interesting content in there. Um, uh, Brad gives away a lot of analytics, frankly, that, uh, quite su that I'm rather surprised at. So very interesting. So. I'll now start and ask the judges what company presentation they voted on and why they made this choice. I'm gonna allow each judge to announce their winner and I will proceed in alphabetical order with first names, starting with Carol Ortega, Tega, Algara. Carol, one to two minutes. Why did you pick, who did you pick as the winner? Well, great presentations today. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, for always choosing leading opportunities in the space. Uh, I really like uh, Claudia's. Um, it's great to see women in the space. Very interesting. And um, I like uh, Voyager. I like the, the fact that they have uh, uh, a strong intellectual property and a, a patent going on. I like uh, that the, the opportunity uh, will allow us to have a probably successful exit. So I will vote for Voyager. Voyager, okay, number one, Voy Voyager. And I'm doing this manually. I should have probably wrote a script for this. Anyways, um, now Cletus Mack. Um, I know you had some issues before. If you're there and you'd like to vote, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the next judge. Cletus, 
going once, twice. If you get this message, you're free to ask me at the end after I've chatted with the other judges. Okay, let's move on to David Cram, uh, co-founder and managing director, Profarian Sapling. Yes. Um, okay, I think every pitch was impressive. I think everyone did an excellent job. However, in my role as a real estate investor and someone who obviously tilts toward plant touching opportunities, the winner in my mind is Nate at Fast Flower, Fast Flower Farms. It was an excellent presentation. Um, great answers on some of my questions also and everyone else's. And uh, we also happen to like the state that he's doing business in. So he gets my vote, but great job every, everyone else. Yeah, no, good presenters here, good presenters. Thank you, David. Okay, let's move on to David Wise, Chairman and Founder, Infinity. Thank you. So uh, again, great job with all the presentations. Um, uh, David Cram seems to be taking my questions <laughs> before I get a chance to ask them. Sorry, right, bud. <laughs> That's all right. And in this case, he also uh, has the same pick as I do. Uh, the reason that I, I, I chose Nate and Fast Flower was that they seem to have the uh, greatest opportunity for any investment to turn into real return on investment, where the other companies just didn't seem, just didn't seem to get me there or seem to know how to get there. Or if they did, something wasn't, was missing in, in the picture. Got it. Got it. You know, David's David's think a lie, huh, David? <laughs> okay. Dr. John Thompson, founder and CEO, Extract Lab. On mute. All right. Hey, uh, I think everybody did a great job. I appreciate all the uh, presenters today. Um, I am pretty partial to um, software and software systems. I think data is always going to be the future. It's going to win. Um, and the faster you get started, the better. I think your projections are actually a little bit um, too low, um, Peter. So I, I, would, I would vote for the Terpley app. Um, I think uh, there's lots of opportunity if you could work it out um, for, you know, for example, um, some sort of a white labeling and, and just push it out. And then you're still aggregating the data. The data is where the money's at in my view. So um, that's where my vote goes. Um, I'm still uh, very, very much so interested in the CBD uh, Denver. That's the second runners up. I don't know if you can, you can do that, but um, I was pretty impressed with how they made money. I still don't know how they're doing it, but I was, I was very, very impressed with that. So, um, so thank you very much. Yeah. Great, great commentary, John. You know, uh, we all know as investors that we have our own preferences, our own profiles, our own risk, what we're willing to do. So it's not a reflection on any particular company. I personally like investing in pipes and private uh, placements, but that doesn't mean that the early startups aren't good. I put money in there too. So it's an expression of a risk profile. And I think that's important that everybody understands that. So Ted Bernhard, Managing Director, Cultiva Law. Thanks. Uh, boy, this is thanks. Thanks everyone for these presentations. They were all really, really good quality, and I very much enjoyed hearing everyone's presentations. I've learned I've learned uh, something about myself in the process of this. Uh, I I didn't know how appealing the international markets were to me until I heard the pitches from um, the, the CBD of Denver and Elixir All Global. I thought those were both uh, uh, really really solid uh, investment opportunities, but I didn't choose either of those as my finalists because of, th they both seem like they're semi-public companies and trading on the OTC and th things like that, that uh, it, until I got a better handle on their publicly available data and the, um, the, the uh, structure, uh, I couldn't do it, but both great presentations. I think you both have great market opportunities, but uh, I ultimately came around to the same thing as the Davids uh, here at, and Fast Flower Farms was the one that I, I liked the most uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, it wasn't a business model that I've never seen before. So I, I almost dismissed it, but the, the detailed understanding of the business and the little things that, that seemed to come through the presentation really 
uh, impressed me great, greatly. And, and there was one line in particular that just hit home that, that was, uh, you know, don't bet on the horse, bet on the jockey. I just have a lot of confidence in that management team and in the market opportunity in, in Michigan expanding elsewhere. So um, great job. Fast Flower Farms gets my vote too. All right, great. And finally, Zach Bernion, Real Estate Acquisitions, Cannabis Venture Partners. Yes, thank you again, everyone, for presenting. Um, I personally went behind uh, Peter Casper as well. Um, I'm very big on education. Um, I look at cannabis as it is a medicine. It is not a drug. Um, and I think that a lot of patients that need cannabis as a medication really need to know what they're taking and what the exact effects are. And that does kind of sound like what exactly Terpley is going for. So Terpley has my vote there. Hey, okay. I'm just waiting to find out who won for the audience. Okay. And let me see. Okay. So th this was close. This is interesting. The audience chose Nate Nihus, Fast Flower Farms. I thought that's interesting. So judges and uh, the audience, interesting. And then Marcel Gamma came in very close second on the audience. And uh, have to say, all of these pitches were good. Um, I personally love software. I think software will eat the world, but that's just me. So let's, well, I guess that wraps up the investor pitch competition for today. So, um, I want to thank all the investor judges and presenting companies. You did a really great job and we appreciate the effort you put into your presentation, the investor judge and the judges as well. It's a lot of work doing this. I, you know, it takes a lot of effort to, to, to actually pay attention to really sort of tease out the details. And uh, we also want especially to thank you, the audience for joining us today from all around the world, 36 countries, five continents. I mean, that's amazing. We would like to remind the audience and the webinar participants that the recordings of today's presentations will be available on the Cannabis Investing Forum website and YouTube channel. For those of you that would like to contact the presenters and investor judges, their emails are available on their section of the Cannabis Investing Forum. And I would like to bring back the Master of Ceremonies, but before I do so, Dr. David Kunick, before I yield the floor, I'd like to acknowledge the high quality of the presentations. I just want to repeat that. I mean, it's amazing. They just get better and better. And I would also like to give Dave, Dr. Dave, Dr. Dr. Dave, double PhD, love it. And Brad Turner, a shameless plug. For anyone who is new to this industry experience but doesn't know have a good deal of experience raising capital, I strongly suggest that you reach out to Dr. Dave and or Brad Turner and work with them to improve your pitch and lead generation. You usually get only one chance before a typical investor group. So make sure you're putting your best foot forward. I don't work for, with Dr. Dave or Brad Turner and I don't get paid for them, by them. I just like what they do and I do this for fun. It's my pleasure being here and thank you for listening to me. Dr. David Kunick, please take it away. John, you're gonna make me blush now with all those nice words. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And you know, before we have all the judges here, I just want to give you a quick round of applause. So thank you for all the judges for volunteering today. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, as John put it best, you know, we're here volunteering our time. And <clears throat> one of the best things here, if you did not present, is hopefully you got some constructive criticism from the judges on what they're looking for. And as David Cram and David Wise said, they might be looking for one certain type of, of business, while some of the other investor judges like, like Ted, Ted Bernard might be looking for a different type of investment. So every, every type of investor really has its own niche. Um, great questions by the judges today. So really do appreciate that. And this completes another episode of the Canvas Investing Forum. Once again, I uh, wanna thank all the sponsors, speakers, investor judges, presenting companies, marketing partners, and especially you, the audience, for joining us today. And we had over 30 countries here today. That is amazing. We also want to remind the audience and the uh, investor judges that you can review all the presentations seen today uh, on the Canvas Investing Forum website. 
In addition, you can locate the email addresses of all the presenters and investor judges so you can contact them directly once again at the cannabisinvestingforum.com website. For future events, please make sure you actually check out your calendar and write down for the next Investor Hot Seat, which will be a virtual webinar on April 29th. And then we're gonna have another uh, Canvas Investing Forum virtual webinar and live event on May 20th. Uh, they're always looking for additional working companies that I'd like to present. Um, we, they're looking for additional investor judges, exhibitors, sponsors, media, and marketing partners. And you can find all that information at investorhotseat.com as well as cannabisinvestingforum.com. And there's a special announcement. If you are in Vegas right now, uh, <clears throat> they are today, they are doing a Chef Matt's Cannabis Madness VIP Penthouse Party at the Rio All Suites Hotel and Casino. You can purchase tickets at the door or online at Eventbrite. So there is an actual in-person proper social distancing event happening in Las Vegas. And now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's about networking. For now we're at the networking part. This is a friendly reminder that you'll need to register, need to register with a new Zoom meeting link to access the networking room after this. It was already posted in the chat before, and it's being posted in the chat right now as I speak. If you can't find it, you can always go to cannabisinvestingforum.com uh, website. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you everyone for, for being here today. Phenomenal job. And that's our event for today.